था मैं विशेष विस्तार में न जाकर के अनुरोध करूंगा उनसे उद्घाटन भाषण के लिए फ्रेंड्स फ्रेंड्स आई कंसिडर टूडेज ऑल माई फ्रेंड्स राइटर फ्रेंड्स यंगर सिस्टर्स एम आई ऑडिबल ओके गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑफ यू the topic of uh, today's uh, national seminar is uh, women empowerment in literature so i am not taking you to the modern literature i am taking you to the ancient literature and uh, all the characters are familiar to you so three four characters i will take from uh, veda ramayan mahabharat and puranas you know them very well but i am placing them here to uh, say that how empowered the, the women were in the ancient literature not in Indi uh, recent literature i don't know this much uh, empowerment uh, they were uh, recent literature doing or not but they were very empowered in literature i consider the two two great epics of the world ramayana and mahabharata and also vedas puranas to be literature of high order they are literature of high order it carries unique reflections of the life and the role of women in ancient times relevant even to in the contemporary times i would like to discuss few women portrayed in the ever mentioned literature who have symbolized the essence of empowerment over time women in vedas ramayana mahabharata and puranas had transpassed the man made social norms imposed on her in term of lakshman rekha had questioned seniors regarding human rights and social justice in the court of hastina by draupadi had stripped herself to make mahishasura powerless and weak as durga for social cause or walking upon the husband's chest like kali to wipe out corruption and terrorism from the society draupadi the enigmatic heroine was a woman who proved herself to be decisive even in the matter of war and peace decision making is the uh, really empowerment uh, we, we say a, a woman is empowered if he she is taking decision in the family matters and other matters here the dropad or dropadi was taking decisive uh, his, uh, mat, uh, that in uh, war and peace and other things so they were consulting the five husbands even krishna were consulting dropadi uh, regarding war let me start from goddess lakshmi goddess lakshmi mahalakshmi in purana stories take birth take birth in during samudra mantana during during the turning of sea and is regarded as daughter of samudra she married vishnu you know all these things are very puran very old to you very familiar to you and uh, she is the protector of the world lakshmi was a symbol of empowerment in primordial society and culture she is the she is worshiped, worshiped as the goddess of wealth and prosperity she is annapurna who feeds to the whole world so she is the finance minister minister lakshmi was the finance minister abhi bhi hai now also we consider lakshmi as the finance minister so how powerful empowered the women were in those days and till today also our finance minister is also a woman am i wrong so 
our modern women are also empowered. Lakshmi, Lakshmi Purana. You will be surprised to know that in Odia literature, in the 15th century, one writer was there, Balaram Das, who wrote the uh, Ramayan. In 15th century, he wrote a story that is Lakshmi Purana. The story is very, very interesting story. Uh, Lakshmi, you know, the wife of uh, Lord uh, Jagannath, and Lakshmi stays in the temple. And uh, because of Lakshmi, the, all the prosperity were in the temple. Lakshmi was a very liberated and uh, modern woman in those days. So every day, mostly on Thursdays, she was visiting the nearby community to say the, see their welfare and uh, about everything, whether they are. Uh, uh, now we are uh, speaking of uh, Swatsata, Swatsa Bharat. In those days, Lakshmi was going to the community to see that whether the community they are maintaining the healthy uh, habits or not, the whether clean and neat and clean their household uh, and uh, coated everything. And she was visiting irrespective of social status and caste. She was visiting the Brahmin house, she was visiting the up other caste out, those who are outcasted. One day she returned late, and Balram, you know, the elder brother, was an angry person, always angry. He became very angry, and he told that to Jagannath that your wife is visiting like this, our Bohu, and uh, she is visiting the outcast houses. Today she entered into the into a house of Chandal, Chandaluni, and uh, she will not be allowed to enter into the temple again. Then they were very Mane, Jagannath knew everything. He knows everything. He smiled. As ever, he smiled and uh, kept quiet. That means Lakshmi was driven out of the temple. You see. And Lakshmi never remained silent. She thought that if I will silently go to my father's house, very near the Samudra, Puri, Puri Sea, ocean is very, very near, she could have gone to the father. She thought that if I will silently return, then in Kali all the men will do to the wives and uh, they will be driven out of the in a world. <coughs> then she went there, she didn't go to the father and built a golden castle near the, on the sea beach. And she ordered the Agnides not to work inside the temple. She ordered the, ordered everybody that all the wealth should be carried down and um, they should be poor. The next uh, morning when the, the, the two brothers uh, got up, they saw that nothing was there. Where is the Ratna Palanka, golden bed? They were sleeping on the floor. And the, there are no servants, no pandas, no breakfast, nothing else. Inside the temple, nothing was there. They could not eat or take breakfast. They thought that it is for one day. Now, what happened? Then they were very, Balram was always very hungry, hungry. Also, Jagannath. You know how much bhoga we uh, every day there. So they went out. Went out and Bet started begging to please give us something to eat. And Lakshmi ordered that the person who will give them food, their house will be wiped out of every wealth, all the wealth. And that happened. Then everybody uh, scolded them and uh, told that you are Lakshmi Soda. Lakshmi Soda. You have uh, showed their hai, Lakshmi ko. So, if you enter in anybody's house, that house will be Lakshmi Soda. So, you go. Then, as a they were very uh, only drinking the water. Then, they went to the sea beach. They saw that it is a golden building, it was not before. Shortly um, they came there, uh, so recently there, it was, that was not there. Who is the owner of the castle? 
they thought it, it must be a very big uh, and uh, prosperous king or queen they will definitely give us food and they went and baked food lakshmi could know who the beggars were then lakshmi said tell them that this is the this is a golden house but the the owner is a chandal are you ready to eat food from chandal's house otherwise we will give you fire and uh, ration so you prepare your own food no 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 you give us food whatever chandal is chandal is our stomach we are chandalos so hunger is chandal so there should be no caste bar so they, they could understand and they ate hungrily they ate there and at last pod pitha rice cake baked rice cake that is the very fond of uh, jagannath prepared by lakshmi and after the meal he takes the pod pitha the pod pitha when came then both the brothers could know that she is no other than lakshmi then they started uh, shedding tears that we are very sorry we uh, apologize you please come to the temple lakshmi said yes i will come to the temple i have every right to come back to the temple but the one condition the condition is you will not restrict me to go to the society to do social works and uh, there will be no caste bar or status bar she is rich she will enter the temple she is brahmin she will enter the temple she is non bhavrin she will not enter the no caste bar no caste status bar this is the condition whenever i will like i will go to uh, any community and i will do community work yes i agree so this story what what uh, story is of 15th century when the feminist theory was now started in europe he is the most feministic writer you may say balaram das so it is in lakshmi purana and lakshmi purana became so popular that nowadays every th- margasi mass the mahina the ma- month of margasi every thursday women observe lakshmi vrata lakshmi puja it, it people thought that it is true but it is a creation of balram das so lakshmi purana is a social change is welcome for gender equality for prosper- prosperity of the society man cannot make prosperous the society women should be there goddess saraswati she is department her department is education you know finance is with lakshmi and saraswati is education minister and she is minister, she is the minister of uh, purity and uh, simple living you know always white kamal white sari white uh, moral so so all the white things she uh, prefers and it symbolizes that simple living high thinking so education minister was saraswati nowadays also we are worshiping them we have not discarded that uh, concept then goddess kali you know probably the uh, it was first mentioned in atharva veda she is depicted in various puranas and uh, devi mahatmya four handed kali wearing a garland of skulls tongue protruded out of mouth red eyes filled with anger and rage holds a crescent shaped sword in one hand and and trident trident in the other she has been depicted as the dresser of uh, of the evil strangely even in puranic literature a woman was required for this role kali epitomizes the assertiveness and represents the force of time then goddess durga you know durga is durgata nasini and whenever there is danger in the society durga is required over a period of time in the indian subcontinent durga has been worshiped as a war goddess the primordial energy adya shakti she has 10 hands with 10 weapons her most important role was to destroy mahishasura who was troubling not only the human beings but also gods 
Durga is mentioned as Durgati Nasini, the destroyer of all danger and uh, humanity of humanity. You see, when the world has, and heaven are in danger, even a woman is required, a goddess is required. <coughs> Women are Shakti incarnation. We are uh, telling Shakti Karan Karenge. Ham Sasakti Karana Karenge. Kya Karenge? Wo to Shakti unke andar mein hai. They are born with Shakti. They are Shakti incarnation. Only thing you do that, don't stand on the way. Don't obstruct. They will show the Shakti in a positive way. If there will be obstruction, they it may go on negative way. Two other women characters, uh, heroine of Ramayan, Sita, and uh, heroine of Mahabharata Draupadi, I may mention. You know everybody, Sita. Sita was Bhumikanya and was adopted by Jan Janaka, the uh, Janaka Rushi. He was also Kim. You know how he was, she was adopted. And uh, Janaka found Sita when he was plowing the field. And uh, Sita was uh, adopted by Janaka, and you know how the marriage was done. The Shiva Dhanu Bhanga, you know, and Rama married Sita, and they entered into Ayodhya. Very young Sita, very young Sita. And uh, the next day they were banished to the jungle with husband. Sita was not banished, Rama was banished. Sita accompanied. Sita said that where Rama is, I will be there. There is my Ayodhya. Where Rama, there is my Ajodhya. So Sita went. Very determined, I will say, girl, in that time. And uh, you know how Ravana came, and there were three uh, Lakshman Rekha. And uh, Lakshman told that you should not uh, cross the Lakshman Rekha. Sita crossed the Lakshman Rekha. It's very symbolic. Why you will uh, draw Lakshman Rekha on the way of a woman? See, crossed the Lakshmanaka and invited the danger. But she did not submit to Ravana. You know, in the Asokavana, Ravana was everywhere, every day Ravana was coming and begging love. Sita was stubborn and did not yield. Therefore, Ravana was kept away. How strong and bold and she was, and rather Ravana could know that Sita's inside is full of strength. So what happened then? Uh, um, Hanuman went there. Hanuman told that, why should there be war, Ma Mother Sita? I will carry you on my uh, shoulder and uh, I will cross the ocean and uh, we will reach Ramachandra. Why should there should be war? Sita said, no. I want to prove the strength and uh, uh, love of my husband, Rama. Rama should come. There should be war. Rama will be victorious. He will rescue me, not you. Then, you know, there was Rama Ravana Yuddha and uh, Ravana died. Sita was carried to uh, Ayodhya and there she had to enter into Agni to prove her chastity, which was not very uh, good for a woman. It is insulting. Even then, Sita agreed. And, you know, for a simple thing, Sita was vanished to jungle when she was uh, in advanced stage. How cruel it was! She went there. When she got up, she was asleep. Lakshmana took took her to the jungle. When she got up, she saw that uh, there is nobody. One letter is was lying there. Lakshmana wrote that uh, Mother Sita, my brother, uh, order uh, me to bring here and leave you here. Patha pachari pita ghara jiva au ajudhya mana na kariba. Dhunte dhunte jao ajudhya, father's house, don't come to ajudhya again. But what, what did Sita do? Sita didn't go to father's house. She thought that why should I, I am a married person, married woman, I will not go to my father's house. And she knew that she has the strength. Uh, to manage herself. Then she gave birth to twin sons. And uh, I think you will agree with me that Sita was the first single parent of the world. 
she she was the first single parent of the world and she taught the uh, two sons uh, shastra and shastra and scriptures and also about warfare and they, they became very um, very um, all round all round in everything and you know one day there was a battle ram and lakshman came to the hill and saw the two boys the two boys said who came with these two persons entering into my mother's territory territory then they fought with father and uncle not knowing that they are father and uncle and they became maybe dead maybe, maybe unconscious then sita found that and uh, valmiki were called and they then they were uh, uh, came to consciousness and they came to know that these two boys are my son and sita he repented and uh, invited them to ayodhya they went again the ram told sita to enter into agni to prove her chastity because she was for some months away from ayodhya alone in jungle then sita what do you think what did sita sita entered into agni again agni means mothers mothers house so earth give the way there is agni sita entered into the mother's slab she was bhumi kanya but the first thing is sita rejected ram here she rejected ram she rejected the ayodhya she rejected the um, the luxury luxury of a queen she said that i am a man i am not being be a toy in the hands of husband this is the sita sita story then draupadi you know i am not going to know no introduction for draupadi you know only one thing i will say that draupadi draupadi question the seniors who are sitting in the uh, kurusabha she for the first time pointed out them what is my am i a object am i a object and uh, am i the property of the my husbands they will uh, baji laga ke khelenge so she pointed out and again she kept her case jo hair open promise that the korabas will be killed and the in the blood she will wash the hair and then she will be uh, not so draupadi was taking decision in every matter people say that uh, everybody says that uh, draupadi is the cause of the war and the devastation of ayodhya i i don't agree it is the korabas korabas as the cause not draupadi so this is draupadi <coughs> then all the characters you know i am not telling any new thing to you then kunti another mahabharata character kunti kunti was vanished to the jungle with a ailing husband and the husband has no power to uh, give birth to children and if there will be sons they will be pandura uh, pale so they will not be able to rule the uh, rule uh, the country aryavartra so therefore sita was uh, draupadi was uh, requested by the heads head of the society that you invite uh, gods four gods four or five gods to give us five sons who will uh, fight against the hundred kauravas you see how liberated she was in those days because that is the cause of society to protect the society she invited four four gods yudhishthira uh, uh, then uh, nay three gods and one god from uh, that nakula uh, sahadev um, they are twins therefore she invited two th- four gods and gave birth to five sons and she was also a single mother in the jungle without any asset she taught the sons the character and the warfare everything and the five brothers defeated 100 kauravas 
another is Sabitri. Sabitri, you know, in our Odisha, uh, Sabitri Brata uh, is observed by wives to for uh, longevity, long longevity of their uh, husbands. The story is there, uh, found in Bana Parva, the book of Horace and Mahabharata. Sri Aramido, Aravindo also have written a very excellent of high order uh, that is Mahabharata Kabya. In the Kabya and also in Sabitri uh, Mahabharata, uh, it is it is described that she is a very determined girl. She just saw once once she saw her husband somewhere, and she was determined that she will marry the person. When she was told by even Narod or Narod that she has only one year to live more, you will lose your husband after one year. She was determined to marry, and promised herself that no one can take my husband if I love my husband. So you know, know the story how on the on the first year when one year was uh, uh, the day, day, day of the death of her husband came, she was going to jungle to cut woods because the uh, their enemies were uh, snapped away their Rajya and their uh, parents uh, had no eyes, they are blind. And they were in a miserable condition and she, he went to uh, that uh, court towards Wood's husband. And she followed her th that day only. That I will follow you. Why are you going? I will go. That was the debt given by Narada that, uh, that husband will die. And you know the story how Yamraj came and he said that, Chod dije, uska jo ayukal khatam ho gaya hai, I will take him to my my kingdom. She said, that, how can you take? I am here. You cannot uh, snatch my husband. So we are together. His uh, longevity is, uh, you say, he completed his longevity. I am alive. We are not two persons. We are one. How can you take one? And, and how can I live? You cannot take my life when my longevity is not there. Then uh, uh, Yamraj uh, told her, okay, you ask any boon. First, you make my uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law, uh, you give back their vision, eyesight. Now, okay. You give back their kingdom. Now, okay. Now, then, okay, chodo. Abhi to mein tumhara husband ko leke jaunga. Na, mujhe to ek bune dana ta hai, na? Na, mangu, kya mangu ta? Na, I pray you to be mother of hundred sons. Ram, very utterly she, he, she asked. And Yamraj, with anger, he, she, he was in anger, that a woman is defeating Yamraj. So she said, okay, okay, you will have hundred sons. And then how can you take my husband? You told that I will have hundred sons. How can you take my husband? You have to return his life. Then Yamraj was defeated. That is the meaning is defeat of death over love. It is in Mahakabya of Aurobindo Savitri and also in uh, uh, Ramayana. Uh, you know the another uh, character, Sakuntala, you know? You know the character Sakuntala? Mahabharata Sakuntala, you know? Sak Dusman Sakuntala? Dusman fell in love with Sakuntala and they were very intimate in the jungle and then he left to his kingdom. And Sakuntala became pregnant and went to the jungle and one ring was given by Dusmata. Uh, the ring she lost in a river. So when she entered the kingdom and told that I am Sakuntala, you married me there in the jungle and I am pre pregnant, I came here to uh, assert my right. 
she said who are you i am not uh, able to uh, know you i don't don't remember that anything happened like that whether it was a uh, kya to protect his face that a king can do that to protect his face or actually it is true how can one forget this because of hearing i think he just pretended that i am not remembering then what happened the sakuntala came back and she stayed in the ashram she was also single parent and she gave birth to a son and the son became so uh, able to manage everything that uh, and she gave the name bharata bharata and according to bharata's names we are now the uh, we are our our country is bharata according to bharata's name our country got the name bharata so there are like many characters if you uh, carefully study not as goddess or gods if you will carefully study that they have given another very interesting thing i i i, I am going to end i am going to end uh, because it is already time ravana the mighty ravana ravana has 10 heads and <laughs> and two hands my brother sir sitting here ravana has 10 heads and two hands to manage two hands two weapons in two hands he needed 10 brain power 10 head brain power of 10 heads and about durga a head head of a woman and 10 hands 10 weapons one head manages 10 weapons in 10 hands whose brain power is more ravana's or durga's man's or woman's it is written by shastrakars all 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 men are have written that no man has written like that all the purana and shastras they it is written by men and all the characters they depicted that means women are multitasking they can do 10 works at a time which man cannot do so friends you are shakti incarnation the shakti is there nobody is going to shakti karan in you it is only i am not going further only thing don't obstruct on our way you will see our shakti education and financial independence all we will get and paramita is sitting there many women are sitting there here those who are all very successful and amara um, or jasodhara mitra is sitting is there all women and she is sitting here i am seeing all are empowered women so no need of empowering us we are empowered we are born in we are in ka shakti incarnation and we are born with shakti thank you my sisters my brothers i told whatever you have told i have not brought anything from my mind it is in written in shastras and puranas thank you very much बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद प्रतिभा जी को उनके बहुत ही सुंदर वक्तव्य के लिए और मित्रों इसके बाद हम अगला विचार का सत्र आयोजित करेंगे जिसकी अध्यक्षता ममंग दई जी करेंगी हम मंच को व्यवस्थित कर लेते हैं
अभी एक की जरूरत पड़ेगी बाकी रखें अभी बुलाते हैं तो पता चल जाएगा हाँ हाँ वो नहीं दो इधर दो उधर बस पांच लगा लीजिए पांच पांच और पांच बोतल निकाल करके रखो पांच बोतल पानी की और ठीक है किस तरह को फिर बोतल और ले आना किस तरह को इधर से किट्स रख दो पासो किट्स किट्स रख दो बैग पहले मित्रों हम अगला सत्र शुरू करने वाले हैं और इसकी इसको चेयर कर रही हैं ममंग दई जी ममंग दई जी से अनुरोध होगा कि वे मंच पर आ जाएं मित्रों इस सत्र में चार वक्ता हैं जैनसी जेम्स जी नीरजा जी पारमिता सतपथी जी उनसे भी अनुरोध है कि मंच पर आ जाएं एक एक वक्ता को हम अगले सत्र के साथ इंटरचेंज कर रहे हैं क्योंकि प्रतिभा नंद कुमार जी को ओके 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 अच्छा अच्छा एक चेयर और लगानी होगी ना तो प्रतिभा नंद प्रतिभा नंद कुमार जी को हम इस सत्र में शामिल कर रहे हैं और भूमा वीरबल्ली जी इस सत्र की शुरुआत करते हैं जेन्सी जेम्स से जेन्सी जेम्स प्रख्यात अंग्रेजी और मलयालम लेखिका अनुवादिका और आलोचिका आलोचक हैं आप महात्मा गांधी विश्वविद्यालय के पूर्व कुलपति और केरल केंद्रीय विश्वविद्यालय की संस्थापक कुलपति हैं आपकी प्रकाशित कृतियों में प्रमुख हैं वर्ल्ड पावर और एज एज आई व्यू माई सेल्फ आपको राष्ट्रमंडल पोस्ट डॉक्टरल फेलोशिप इंडो कैनेडियन शास्त्री फाउंडेशन फैकल्टी रिसर्च फेलोशिप और एम एम वी वाई पायली पुरस्कार सहित कई पुरस्कार प्राप्त हैं जेम्सी जेम्स जो जेम्स Okay good afternoon everyone and welcome to our very distinguished panelists it's a really a great pleasure to be here and we thank the sahitya academy more on this uh, later because i would like to get started with the session we were very privileged also to hear our literature laureate madam prativa rai talking to us and giving us the guidelines you know from women in ancient vedic texts how empowered we are and never to forget that now wo kehte hue i have a little lingering uh, questions about the topic itself whether it's literature for women empowerment literature in women empowerment or women empowerment in literature you know the other way round so i am looking forward to our very distinguished speakers who will be talking and then maybe we can open up 
the floor. We also have uh, one other person here now with us, Pratiba Nand Kumar, because she has to catch a flight. So we will extend this session by about another 20 minutes, half an hour, because the second session will have one person less. Anamika ji has not arrived yet, but I'm sure she'll be agreeable to that also. And if the panelists agree, we will continue as the list is, starting with uh, Dr. Jancy, please. Esteemed chair and co-panelists, uh, honorable writer, Madam Pradipa Roy and friends. Um, this is going to be a raise against time and raise against um, voices from outside. Um, uh, as already informed, uh, I will be talking about uh, women empowerment and women's literature in Malayalam, the language of my state and my mother tongue. Well, um, to confine this into 10 minutes is a, uh, is a real feat. Um, well, I will skip whatever I have, you know, most of what I have uh, uh, written down. Um, actually, um, in the case of Kerala, it's an empowered state, actually, uh, in terms of women's performance, women's, for women's history also, social history also but many more miles to be covered. My topic is about the relationship between um, women's writings and this continuing process of the history of women empowerment in real life. I myself probably uh, is, a, is an indication of this uh, historical process. I happen to be the first woman vice chancellor of Kerala. I just start my paper. Um, the women of Kerala have had a long tradition of enlightenment, though it was confined to those of the elite and upper caste in the 18th and 19th centuries. Though they were not allowed to go to schools and acquire formal education, home tuition was arranged uh, for them in Sanskrit, classical literature, music, or some other form of art. This facilitated the efforts of many of these ladies especially of the royal families, to write some words or poems, uh, devotional hymns, etc. They were scripted in Sanskrit. Manorama Tamburati, who belonged to the royal family of Calicut in the 18th century, is considered to be the first woman writer of Kerala. I'm skipping these areas because I can mention many of these princesses who sat at home, got educated, uh, in Sanskrit and classical literature, and wrote poems. Uh, I'm not actually going to enlist them, but at the same time, it meant a lot that these princesses, instead of you know, uh, getting into other matters, started writing. And one uh, person that I would like to quote is Thotta Kartikavama, who lived from 1864 to 1916. Uh, it's one of the most famous, the second generation of Malayalam women poets. Even Malayalam itself got, you know, its identity much later. Earlier it was Sanskrit, mix of Malayalam and then into Malayalam. This lady poet, she wrote a verse drama called Subhadrajanam. And I'm just quoting a few lines to give you a beginning, uh, an idea of the start of women's writings in Malayalam. She, uh, I'm quoting her, Din Bhama the daring, uh, the darling of Krishna wage battle? Didn't Subhadra hold the reins of the chariot once? Doesn't Queen Victoria reign over the whole world? If women are skilled in all these, how can they not be fit just for the famed art of poetry? So this is written in the, in the last part of the 19th century. And we should also uh, realize that there was a shift from poetry to prose which also meant, uh, you know, a strengthening of women's writing in Malayal. Um, uh, for example, Ambadi Kathya Niyama, who wrote from 1895 to uh, 1999, she wrote as a woman 
and sometimes four women too, as early as that. Now, these early writings are mostly devotional poems, but even they matter because uh, they matter in the study of the relationship between literature and women empowerment because they depict the seminal urge of the feminine self for expression. The turn of the 20th century heralded the emergence of a host of gifted women writers who thought, felt, and expressed far ahead of their times in their perspectives on society, family, and man-woman relationship. Many of the greatest women writers of Kerala were born in the first decade of the 20th century. They included Niladambika Andarjanam, Balamani Amma, K. Sarasudhi Amma, uh, who, who proclaimed herself as the feminist writer, short story writer in Malayalam, Mary John Thornton, who became a nun and then later came to be known as Sister Beni Beninya, a huge volume of poems this uh, sister wrote. The atmosphere of the collective and organized move against foreign rule, the British, the colonizing British power, and the resultant wave of desire for political freedom propelled the female mind from the personal and familial concerns into a wider social world around and sensitized to the thinking, writing woman into thoughts about her female self. Participation, active as well as in spirit, in the political freedom movement, conscientized the woman about the denial and suppression of freedom within the family and discrimination in society on the basis of not only religion, caste, community, and financial status, but also of gender. This was a social and psychological kindling of the spirit of liberation. This fresh response, consequent on a new awakening, was a milestone in the history of women's writing all over India, especially in Kerala, where the spirit of renaissance had heralded an atmosphere of enlightenment. Missionary service, social reformers, spreading of education, etc., catalyzed this social vision. Many women wrote without even realizing that they were challenging the existing gender code of conduct and image of women as mandated by society. Women's writings in Kerala from the first decade of the 20th century itself turned revolutionary, radical, and critical of patriarchal domination that had led to inhuman denial of justice to women. Women from unexpected corners of society used their pen as mighty sword to strike at the roots of inequality and cruelty based on gender. Ledadambika Andarjanam, probably you heard of her. She has been translated profusely into other um, languages also. And she's also, I think, one of the Czechs in um, American universities. Ledadambika Andarjanam was Kerala's greatest literary spokeswoman of maltreated womanhood. No other writer has engaged herself so consistently and devotedly in the task of exposing so sincerely and critically the inhumanity, misery, and shame that women of a particular community have been subjected to during a long dark phase in the cultural history of Kerala. Her efforts led to a shocking revelation of the unholy alliance between traditional taboos and the selfish domination of man over woman. Her voice of moral, integration, moral, in, moral indignation reverberated for nearly 50 years as a challenge to the inhuman customs that imposed continuous torture on the female body and mind. Her treatment of the tragic plight of women was charged with unprecedented compassion and rationality that, smoothed, that soothed thousands of suffering female hearts and kindled hopes in them. Today, those anti-woman primitive practices, see the women of this Brahmin community, Nambudiri, they were, you know, given the name, their surname was Andarjanam, women in door. So, she wrote about them, she wrote about the, the, you know, I'm not going to that custom where only the eldest brother was allowed to marry from within the community. So the younger brothers always, you know, went outside the community and not married, but got into alliance with the lower caste women. So there was a big shortage of men. So what happened was that one elder brother married again and again and again. And the women, even 10 year old girls were married to 90 plus year old. Uh, old men. Within days, the 11-year-old girl became a widow. So, uh, Andarjanam, who belonged to this community, you know, literally, she was the mother of seven children, a homemaker. Literally, with one hand, she wrote short stories, and with the other hand, she rocked the uh, cradle of a baby. So, and now, 
these customs are a gone story in the community and i think the present generation does not even know about it so that was a that is a vital link between women's writing and um, women's liberation women empowerment in kerala although it is limited to nambudiri community that she wrote about probably you must have heard about her stories uh, uh, most famous of them kutta sammadam and pradigara devada pradigara devada is you know goddess of revenge where one one character because she is subject she was subjected to home trial which is called a smart vijar if there is any suspicion about any woman within the family she was subjected to this home trial and after the trial she was driven out to the home and she was late, then named sadhana object a thing she was no more a human individual so all this you know came to a stop because of the writings of uh, ladadambika andarjana i'm just quickly going from there um, uh, well short story short story became a big uh, mode medium of writing for uh, women writers in kerala in fact you might have heard of sara joseph manasi gracie kr meera shahina uh, and women from all communities also see how within the short frame you know they brought the whole issues of discrimination and humiliation that women were going through and you have also probably heard of definitely have heard of kamala das the indo-anglian poet who is actually madhavi kutti to keralaites no malayalis she writes as madhavi kutti in in malayalam her short stories were a big revolution because she sort of laid bare to the whole world the mind of woman all that women so far hesitated and feared to speak about the kind of humiliations even the sexual urges and sexuality everything she simply dug out she had to pay for it of course but in the history of the liberation and empowerment of women this matter i would say because i think uh, uh, i can't take more time so in the history of malayalam uh, women's writing um, the history is definitely definitely linked to the history of uh, malayali women and uh, you see here what happened was i, I myself was a part of uh, Uh, that big project called women writing in india 600 bc to the present in which i for which i was the malayalam associate editor it was surprising how you know women had started writing k saraswati amma who wrote uh, in early in the 40s and 50s she has even written a short story called feminist that terminology was not even you know prevalent at the time she wrote and she wrote one essay a, a collection of essays called purushan mar illa the logam men world without men at the time and because she had provoked the society so much she was ignored by the critical circle she was also uh, when i started you know for this uh, uh, working for this project on women writing it was not possible for me to even come across a collection of her stories because it was deliberately hidden in the issue, in the section of the library where it was lying dusted you know dusted and nobody would ever think that you know it is available there and later on i came to know that sk patakar the janavid award writer in one of his private letters to his uh, colleagues wrote this woman we have to do something about suppressing her i'm quoting him so this is a, a kind of you know uh, amazing uh, history of struggle and today today we have a long list of women writers who have also been considered in the mainstream writers list that is the greatest uh, you know we have even uh, been we have even coined a term called a pennelta pennelta is you know women's writings but now we don't need that it is elta it is not pennelta it is not just writing of women it is real writing we have even coined a word called madrugam paidrugam is paternity madrugam there is no malayalam word in madrugam but then the writers coined that word madrakam and uh, madam pratibha rai was uh, you know narrating a great proud story of uh, our own you know epic women but now one trend very important trend of women writing in malayalam is subversive retellings of the epic characters sara joseph has written many stories based on the women characters one i mentioned yesterday in an interactive session ashoka where sita is not 
is not she is not immersed in shoga she is without sorrow because she realizes that those whom she considered to be the custodians of her pride have actually deserted her there is also and she has also written a story called tai kula which is about shurpanaka shurpanaka whose body was mutilated because she expressed her sexuality and her uh, breasts were you know cut off the story is titled tai kulam because it is the springs of maternity which were cut off when she was mutilated so the, the this, it's a story supportive of uh, um, uh, shurpanaka i'm not saying these are the, the the real truths but this is one way of writing for women and ahalya puranam so many stories which are based on ahalya there is one story by a not so powerful feminist writer or anything sri devi she wrote a story called the stone woman in which ahalya refuses to be a woman anymore once she comes to know that rama has abandoned sita she says i don't want to go back to my human entity uh, by being by being blessed by a person who doesn't care for women so she goes back to her stone stage so these are all attempts you know i'm not saying you should take it as you know literal thing or but, but these were all struggles on the parts of women to show how there is a whole world of suffering that is happening in the world of women and i'm sure before the chair asks me to stop i must stop there um, well uh, the most significant characteristic of the work of these contemporary women writers is their use of the language as i said that makes irreverence an art whatever has revered so far has been turned into you know objects of irreverence it's a counter construct to patriarchal discourse and it sustains itself on a devastating manipulation of the oppressor's language their writing is a fierce attempt at burning language quoting monic that poisons the glottis women don't have a language of their own because it's a man made language so we don't even have an adequate medium to express this uh, the, the 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 real sentiments the real feelings their thematics foreground the psyche process of the rebellious female a vision that rejects the chores and dictates of domestic life and put the vomit on a defiant display it is a writing that gives violent hurt to all citadels of patriarchy including literature religion education marriage and the value system it is a meta fiction that demythologizes demythologizes the existing images of womanhood by decolonizing them from patriarchal norms the iconic pre- presentation of the feminine is fractured and is remythologized into violent imit- manifestations um, of the rejected assumptions that patriarchy maintained for generations about womanhood i'll close there there are also narratives you know stories and poems uh, about which i have already written a paper um, escaping the homesick where the domesticity the chores of domestic life madam referred to lakshmi in indian culture the woman is called the griha lakshmi but the griha lakshmi is an eternal sufferer so we have so many stories for example a story written by valsala shishrathila urumbugal you know the, the ends of winter in which you know a woman she so much burdened with the domestic chores and you know every t- she is no she is also a working lady no time so finally what she, she feels that she is surrounded by ants everywhere wherever she turns she finds ants finally she takes you know a uh, 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 a matchstick and uh, sets fire to the ants because there is a proverb in malayalam illam chuduga burn your house to kill the rats so she uses that frame and you know lights fire to the she thinks that there are ant hills around but she actually commits suicide by setting fire to her own sari and you know, there are immense Im- that there are so many you know this kind of challenges to the domestic life which ultimately under the name under the name of griha lakshmi punishes her manasi also has written many stories one i myself have translated the sword of the princess in which you know there is a fant- fantasy scene in which the woman who gets up early in the morning lights the fire Uh, makes coffee and finally drags herself half half asleep to the husband and she she kills the husband with a sword i'm not saying that you know you should kill husbands but you know these are all fantasies these are all you know kind of uh, 
symbolic ventures, symbolic gestures, which actually ring the bell for society to be alerted about the fact that equality, you know, is actually a birthright. I'm just closing there because I know that I, I'm, I'm depriving others of the time. Um, I'm just reading the last part of this uh, last paragraph. Um, um, one thing that I wanted to probably some of the researchers would respond. Uh, my, my own uh, article from Veneration to Virulence, which is published in 1992, is, a, um, is, is on the net and is a research material for many. You see, after the independence, in the independence struggle, the women, many women took part. But after the independence, there was a tragic realization on the part of women that colonize, decolonization has not taken part in their lives. There is a political decolonization, political independence, but the independence of women, gender independence, was yet, you know, something to happen. So this disillusionment, this kind of a sudden awakening of the need for freedom on the basis of gender, this is characterized in many of the writings of Kerala and also uh, in all languages probably of India. Last para, and I will not take more time. Women's literature in Kerala has come of age. The new generation of women writers like Priya A.S., Priya A.S., K.R. Meera, Shahina, Yama, etc., have carried the world of literary expression to magic realism, postmodernist diction, and a combination of history, myth, truth, fantasy, and imagination. All these narrative devices ultimately aim at the liberation and empowerment of women and an inclusive society where gender will not be a bondage, but a means for a healthy, and just bonding for humanity. Literature empowered women with the purposive support of those who empowered themselves through fearless expression, that is the writers. Kerala women and society testify to such a history and experience of mutual empowerment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jen C. James G. Now may I request uh, uh, Nirajaji. Nirajaji is a poet, novelist, columnist, and a short story writer in Marathi. She has one novel, six collections of poetry, four of short stories, and three of literary prose, besides three edited books to her credit. Her works have been published in different literary magazines and uh, has been included in different university syllabus. She has received several awards and honors, including six Maharashtra State Awards, Maharashtra Foundation Awards, America, Master Dinanath Mangeshkar Vag Vilasini Award, ATC. Nirajaji. The Vishji, we are empowering you with giving that signal when it's <laughs> the last two minutes up. Okay, I would request all the uh, readers to kindly look towards the Vishji. But no hurry, please take your time. Okay, thank you. uh, good afternoon, everyone, here on the dais and in the audience. Uh, let me thank Saitya Academy for inviting me to participate in the panel discussion. I am here to represent Marathi and I am presenting a paper on women empowerment and Marathi literature. Women empowerment and literature are interrelated. I think that literature empowers women and empowered women rule the world of literature. Taslima Nasrin wrote in one of her essays on censorship that when I started writing, people asked me what was my problem. I said that I didn't have any problem. They were surprised. In my country, men write and they think it is their right to write. And if any woman ri starts writing, that woman must have some problems. Maybe they are unhappy in their private life. It is believed that if any woman is very unhappy at home, she becomes a prostitute or commits suicide or starts writing. This is Taslima's quote. It shows that people think that when a woman has any problem, she starts writing. Otherwise, there is no need for her to write. They forget that like any creative artist, women also have an aesthetic sense. Like any creative writer, they see the world from their own perspective. 
they go on observing people around them they think about different issues mankind is facing and they also have their own views and opinions on social as well as political issues in the patriarchal society it is completely forgotten that she is as much a sensitive person as a man but in this patriarchal society talking is always perceived as a masculine activity assertive activity and listening is perceived as passive feminine and a less valuable activity so women spend their whole life listening to men people sometimes say women talk too much but i think they talk loudly and too much only because they don't want to hear their own inner voice if they start talking there will be earthquakes as namai wolf said earthquakes are not sudden unpredictable events but the results of a uh, eons of silent tectonic pressure but today these all these suppressed voices have started expressing themselves through different forms of literature such as poetry short stories novel plays essays etc so literature has become a tool of self expression and self identification which is one of the powerful tools of empowerment of women internally as well as externally due to several movements for equality and women's rights which had taken place all over the world women's empowerment became major issue in the last century it is somewhat universally recognized that the idea of empowerment in the context of women is based on the values of freedom rights and equality it demands removal of historical and structural discrimination against women in personal and public domain it demands equal treatment and equal opportunities for women in all spheres of life that is financial political social educational etc regardless of the differences based on caste religion culture race or nationality in essence empowerment is all about treating a woman as fully human it is about making her aware of her independent existence and giving her the power to assert her humanness and release herself from the traditional frame made by the male dominated society but despite the efforts taken by social reformers before independence and efforts on the part of the government and activists after independence women are able to contribute very little to the financial independence and decision making process hence efforts addressed to gender equality and justice still need to be accelerated how can this idea be accomplished fundamentally it requires that a woman is freed from what can be called dependency syndrome in most spheres of her existence a woman is structurally dependent on her father her husband her son we are not just now pratibha ji said but we are talking about few women here maybe the dropadi and lakshmi in past or in our mythology and all those stories or who are sitting here but when we talk about the women in this country or all over the world in general this is the thing so it require i feel that even in manusmriti all of us we know that it is clearly stated that a woman is dependent on her father in childhood on her husband after marriage and her son in old age so women's empowerment as at its core is the process of freeing women from this condition of structural dependence through the realization of her internal strength in this sense women's empowerment is much wider than merely political social or economic empowerment the real basis of women's empowerment is inner that is emotional as well as psychological empowerment i think that the importance of literature and writing lies as a tool of empowerment of women and achievement of gender justice literature has been deeply influenced by the turning concerning women's right and equality that ensures feminist struggles all over the world it is therefore necessary to analyze literature as a domain that reflects and advances concerns of gender justice and women's empowerment women's literature in a way is a reflection and continuation of the society's quest for women's equality and rights efforts to empower women started in maharashtra in the 19th century social reformers such as mahatma jyotiba phule maharshi karve his son ragunath rao karve actually in those days before independence ragunath rao karve in his um, uh, 
weekly used to write about many issues of women and one of the issue was her sexual desires which were suppressed and not allowed to voice in public in indian society so that has been written by means in samaj swastha and before independence so many other like this uh, reformists they realized uh, that education is the only way to make women aware of their plights and rights you must have heard about savitri bai phule and tara bai shinde and mukta and fatima sheik they were the empowered women of 19th century who dared to speak and write about their plights and rights in the 20th century many women writers started writing in marathi but marathi literature has a great tradition of revealing women writers especially writers of bhakti tradition that we call it varkari sect that is these are really rebel those are rebel, uh, really rebellious Santa Mukta Bai, who is the Ganeshwar's sister, she has written in one poem, "Mungi udali akashi, tine girele surya shi." The meaning is that the ant flew in the sky and shallowed the sun. So in this abhanga, she is trying to say she is seeing the dream of touching the sky. The woman who has been considered as small as ant has the capacity to touch the sky. This statement in 13th century she has made. janabai her i mean somewhere nearby that time only she went one step further and leaves the home just to uh, meet god which was there in her uh, uh, heart and that heart was that god was vithala so in her poem she said doisa padar ala khandavari bharala bazari jain mi jani mhane deva jhale mi vesava nikhale keshava ghar tujhe Now what she is trying to say here, जो पल्लू आज तक मेरे सर पे था वो अब कंधे पे आ गया है और हे भगवान तुम्हारे लिए मैं वेश्वा वेश्या हो गई प्रोस्टिट्यूट हो गई क्योंकि भरेला बाजारी में भरे बाजार में मैं जा रही हूँ और the women who go to in भरे भरे बाजार in those days were considered as prostitutes. So I am ready to become veshwa for you. I am ready to become prostitute for you, but I want to meet you. And she comes to meet her vithala. so these things were written in those days even in 16th 17th century some uh, uh, these say, uh, writers uh, women poets they talked about menstrual cycle and said that there is nothing wrong in that all these things when it was not allowed to speak about those these uh, writers used to talk about it so i feel that marathi has a tradition of activist poetess which has continued in the uh, or to the 20th century and especially after independence and that is after 70s of the last century they started writing about their exploitation pain their inferior status in the society poets and novelists and short story writers like padma gode mallika amar sheik pradnya daya pawar gauri deshpande vibhari shirurkar kamal desai saniya meghna pete many names are there i don't want to uh, take this but as uh, uh, we have this rich uh, Uh, that hierarchy or uh, of uh, women writer in malayali or in many other languages same way we are also having so all these are uh, even kavita mahajan is there all of them they enriched marathi literature all of them are bold enough to ask questions to the society which has taken them for granted for hundreds of years mallika amar sheik uh, namdev dhosar's name you are, uh, all of you must have heard uh, she is having a separate identity his wife She has written in one one poem, "Shaharatle ani jagatle baika vicharat padlyat." He chitra awardnar nahi kunalat. Ta ekter priya karacha bahu pasha dastat kyu abhinashi hat kordle li murti astat. Ani he chitra badalna ta adhikar tanna dila nahi kuni. The meaning is the woman in the city and the world are engrossed in thinking. Nobody would like this picture. Nobody would like this picture. They are either in the arms of their lover. or the helpless statue of venus whose hands are cut off and nobody gives them the right to change this picture means if the society is not giving this right but they are asking for it many of the writer many poets especially pradnya pawar or prabha ganorkar they are talking about changing the script of the writing also for the women they want to make their own script pradnya pawar she is saying that i am pounding all the words the language this is made by men and that i am pounding and trying to find out different words for me which are only for me and actually which are very valuable for the society 
I, we always, I always feel that uh, women are more creative and uh, the world which is destroyed, the world power games are played. Even women can play power games. It is not that they don't play. But this is the thing that they are more creative than destructive. So she is trying to find the words like Pradnya, Karuna, Daya. These are the words she, uh, compassion and all these words are more important because they don't talk about violence. They always talk about love and compassion. At the same time, they want to create, I feel that's you now uh, one uh, more thing. These women, they want to create their own word also. All of you must have heard about Gauri Deshpande and if you are not read, you feel that she was the first feminist. She doesn't consider when she was alive, she never used to say that I am feminist writer. But we learn from her what is the freedom of the woman. In one of her story, I will give example of that. She say, uh, she is, uh, that the name of the story is Right on Sisters. And um, you know, generally men always say that, Are kya ye gale mein phanda paad ke liye, laga ke liye hai, shadi karke, ya abhi inko sabko samhalna hai, they don't give us space, they don't do this, they don't do that. So that kind of complaints are there. So the protagonist of the story, she says that if all, it is as if these all nursing and sages are ready to get married just to favor women. If these men find marriage, children, wives so bothersome, we should all do one thing. All women should do one thing. All women should form a housing colony or their own commune. There would be an entry fee for all the men. If you want your shirt washed, pay money, huh? pay fees. If you want us to cook, pay the fees. You want a woman in the bed, pay the fees. You want a child to carry forward your name, pay the fees. So this kind of language, these women, and they are asserting themselves. One of our story, thank uh, uh, Gauri Deshpande, uh, this protagonist Kalinda, Kalindi, sorry, takes uh, uh, one, one night, she wakes up in the middle of the night and she takes her husband in her arms and her husband shakes her off as if shaking off the fly and uh, says, let me sleep, damn it. He says that. At that time, this Kalindi thinks, she feels insulted and she says, the fury made my mouth bitter. How many times has he kept me awake because he felt like it and taken his pleasure? And I had also consented to it like a slave. Tomorrow I will also say for sure, let me sleep, damn it. So this is what her protagonist is saying. So these kind of stories, these kind of poems were written in last 50 years, even short stories and novels also by these women writers. So what I was saying in the beginning, I just said that my statement I made that women empowerment and literature are interrelated in this way. That the literature empowers women. So whatever you read, whatever you hear and whatever, see all our stories, Mahabharata, Ramayana, or whatever stories, folk stories we are having, we learn from them lots. So my generation read all these writers, Gauri Deshpande or Yuvhari Shirurkar or Janabai or Muktabai or Savitibai Phule or whatever Mahatma Jyotiba Phule has written in Sarvajanik Satya Dharma. I, we wrote, read all these things and we became empowered in different sense. That way, that we realize that we can find the word which we were finding all these years. And that word or that kind of thing we can express wherever. It is not necessary literature. I became poet, but and many women who read all these people, they became activists, they started doing something or the other thing for the women or for the upliftment of uh, the, uh, other people. So I feel that this is the benefit of the literature for women development and many, as I said, that women can, and even I will give, just now she, uh, Pratibhatai has given, I'll call her, uh, Pratibhaji has given an uh, example of Savitri. In a, my, one of my poem, which is addressed to Savitri, I uh, ask her question that uh, if your Satyavan would have burned you alive or beaten you for your father's uh, property or his whatever, Rajya and Wale, whatever, how many uh, means what you would have, uh, if you would have asked for a long life of him, <laughs> that question I asked you, 
you really would have asked that long life because so many women who are doing this vrata they are suffering and that i feel that most of the women in their mind they don't want that long life of that man they want to uh, get rid of him sometimes they say that thing and then also we, we go on doing this vrata so if we go to the common people common women and all most of them are doing because there is a pressure of the society they are supposed to do it and that's why they are doing all these vratas and all all the actually savitri i always tell savitri is such a intelligent lady that she because of her her husband was alive she argued with yama and she he, she brought his life back so i always tell my uh, students or uh, all the women why you are doing this vrata satyavana should do that vrata we should do the vrata and they should say that we should get five like savitri who will bring uh, us from the de- uh, what uh, jaws of the death or yamayana so this kind of uh, writing we are having one last example i'll give again one poem of, of my own which gauri deshpande has translated what i am waiting for for him to ride in on a white horse and carry me off into some dreamland of his own actually i want to raise the reins from him and take them in my hands and also wish to take away his constant guard at the door of my womb's path so this is what we started writing our generation started writing and this is the i think these examples are more than enough to tell you that how literature empowers women and empowered women can write what they feel what they write they are free to write and they are free to ask their about their rights and most of the uh, marathi writers they are also pol- means we generally say that politics is a sphere of men generally women writers they don't write about political issues and all in their uh, uh, what uh, novels or even poetry and all but today many of them are writing it and we are uh, having that daring we uh, enough to uh, yeah kisi se bhi panga lene ka <laughs> daring aa gaya hai so that is what uh, literature has given us thank you very much for calling me thank you so much for your thank you very much nirja ji now may i request uh, paramita satpathi ji uh, she is a bilingual writer so far 25 published books are to her credit in odia and other indian languages her works have been published in all the leading literary journals and included in anthologies and course curriculum of several colleges and universities besides uh, being translated into other european languages she has received sahitya academy award for her collection of short stories prapti sarala award and many other awards she joined indian revenue services in 1989 and is presently working as principal commissioner of income tax in new delhi paramita satpathi the inaugurator of this lovely session dr pratibha rai uh the chairperson another lovely writer mamang dai my fellow panelist and the eminent writers and friends that i see here very good afternoon to all of you much has been spoken by nirja and jessi on the subject i'll not be taking long just wanted to add few uh things uh according to me literary activity has always been affected by the social cultural and political acceptance men and women received in their times writers are sensitive towards exploitation of the weaker inequality be- between human beings lack of freedom in expression and living the state of affairs of those human beings who suffer without any fault of theirs and suffer because of irrationality of the society has always caught their imagination and has eternally been portrayed through their writings the cause of women and the cry for their emancipation have thus entered literature since time immemorial it would be interesting to uh, discuss maybe very briefly 
what have been the ingredients of wars by women authors in the present times because dr pratibha rai had talked about the epics and the mythological characters and few of my uh, fellow panelists also talked about it we all are aware that in the past 100 years or so the status of women in the society the perception perception about women their expectations from and experiences in life have gone a sea change literature being a mirror of society has well portrayed their struggle their plight their convictions their deliverance through words and idioms such creative expressions have become more convincing when women authors started telling stories of her the journeys in their life and the ex experiences they have encountered in the way since consciousness in women writing has been correlated positively with the consciousness towards the cause of women her sufferings and her existence the idea of protest against the present conditions of women the idea as articulated through feminism comes to picture the feministic movement all over the world therefore has influenced the writings of women feminism has crept into the minds of women of the late 20th century that is different in indian and in the western scenarios in indian context perhaps the idea of feminism means to accept responsibility and duties of women towards family and society in return women expect recognition for their sacrifices honor for their dedication the demand to get importance for the services they render to the family and the society globalization media communications etc are changing the world in a mind boggling speed our beliefs values attitudes are get going through tremendous metamorphosis women increasingly are getting job security enjoying economic independence and attaining prestigious positions in different fields they dress themselves in modern attires and feel liberated also but in reality they are still struggling against their inner darkness the fetters on their personality and the limitations of the society this conflict of the new woman has always influenced the writings of the contemporary women authors they try to portray this dilemma and shape characters around this conflict they feel at one with the vulnerability of women of today and try to transcribe her will power and convictions through their writings so has literature been always regarding creative musings what about the women who are in the margin women who are poor who are tortured and who are exploited well they cannot read what we are writing they cannot even perceive what we are writing well uh here comes the role of our literature through myth folk tales and folklore they have created women icons which have been considered empowered some time back dr pratibha rai we are talking about the women icons of mahabharat and ramayan for the sake of repeating i am just talking about uh, one or two lines about panch kanyas ahilya draupadi kunti tara mandodari tatha panch kanyas marenitam mahapatak nashanam all of these five women were not conventional but were embodiment of courage and conviction our sage poets have assured us to remember them every day poets have narrated about the heroism the courage and the conviction they had in life and for all we know some of the creators of the epics and the icons could be women writers and poets and the, in the present time uh, dr pratibha rai has jageshani and mahamoha most of you must have read and all through the country women writing women authors are writing and in redefining the mythological icons and characters i myself have also been writing on panchkanyas um taking the these myth mythological women icons and their predicament and a modern women being put in the same situation and her reaction to that my grandmother used to say if you bury a woman in earth today she will germinate into a lovely sapling grow into a tree get full of flowers and laden with fruits 
then she would sometime narrate a story with this theme or hum or tune of a folklore. It has been our culture, our tradition depicted through our myths and folklore. All of us unanimously say how resilient, how patient, yet how intelligent women have been through ages. Our folk tales and folklores through ages have imbibed that sense of empowerment in women. We have listened to um, Odia and then uh, to, um, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Prathibharai spoke for the whole of the literature and Jansi for Kerala and Marathi uh, by Nirja. Um, we do find reflections of empowerment of women through all uh, uh, literature in all Indian languages. Um, in Odia, um, as far as I remember, um, in early 20th century, there was this firebrand politician and poet and writer, Sarla Devi, who at that point of time had written a uh, book um, titled Demands of, Demand of, Demands of a Woman. And where she has written in 1930, the body of a woman is hers, and it is she who should decide what to do with that. Imagine the time and what kind of furor it must have created when she had written this kind of a thing up at that point of time. And after that, Odia literature has been very nicely and very uh, cordially has taken it forward. Dr. Uh, to take few names, Dr. Pratibha Ray, Bidampani Mahanti, my mother Pratibha Satpathi, Yashodhara Mishra is here, I in between, and up to the youngest Gayatri Bala, we all are taking this tradition ahead. Well, uh, when we talk of um, women empowerment, I guess a creative writer is distinguished from a social worker. She uses words to impress and inspire, but doesn't give slogans. A creative writer sees what is not generally visible to others. The space in between the written lines conveys more than the words can communicate. She tries to extrapolate life into her work. She pokes at the mind of the, and the conscience of the reader, poses possibilities before him, stirs his ability to think, and it is possible that the reader thinks and acts. Well, in a country like ours, it is not an easy task to trace the age-old writings by women. Social and historical obstructions were rampant against women writing, and for that matter, any kind of creative expression by women. Perhaps for this reason, we do not have a sober volume of critical evaluation of women writing. And in Odia, we have very few. That is why we could not trace, though this is a classical language, still we have failed to trace the women writing beyond maybe 500, 600 years or so. Well, there is also a saying, when a woman dies, her fame spreads through the fume from the pyre. Probably when she's alive, she is destined to live under-evaluated. But for the past few years, the women writing in India has acquired a spectrum of multi-dimension and has been illumined with artistry. Art of expression, like a blooming lotus, is unfolding its petals one after the another, spreading fragrance and bliss all over. As a profound right reader, I have got to read many of the works of the Indian as well as world-renowned women authors. I have been spellbound, amazed, have been struck with awe at the stretch of feminine imagination, feminine intellect, feminine intensity, and feminine metaphors these authors have infused into their work. Probably, it is the element of feminine imagination that distinguishes the work of the female authors from those of others. I believe a creative woman rejoices femaleness through her writings, the boldness, the true to the self-expression, the power of imagination, the coat of artistry, she ventures to put on the characters she produces. Because this feeling only urges a woman to be creative in, this, in her own special way. I'm very tempted, I have been writing about the condition of women like all of you here. So I'm very tempted to recite a two minutes poem, probably I have time. Uh, I'll recite this in Hindi, uh, because I guess the translated I write in Odia. The translated poem is uh, in Hindi is very true to the uh, actual poem that I have done. And my translator, Dr. Rajendra Prasad Mishra is here, who has given a face to Odia literature in 
Indian scenario, Indian like literary scenario. Uh, the title of the story, title of the poem is Sari. It goes like this. साढ़े पांच मीटर की मर्यादा से मैंने खुद को लपेट लिया है और अपने गारिमा में खुद उलझ रही हूं याद नहीं कभी ये मर्यादा किसी से हाथ पसार कर मांगी थी या जबरन खींच लाई थी या किसी का लाल आंखों का इशारा था या था सपने में खोए उस नौजवान का घबराया सा पहला उपहार मेरे अपनी दूसरे बहने अपने मन मन मुताबिक कहते थे महिमा अपने परिधान के कि सुविधा सरल स्वच्छंद ऐसे कुछ शब्दों के जामिती पर मैं चुप थी कैसे समझाती उन्हें कि मेरा परिधान आध्यात्मिक है रात को घर लौटकर नाप जोक कर इस साड़ी के कई टुकड़े किए और सारे टुकड़े मंत्र पढ़ पढ़कर उठ उड़ा दिया एक टुकड़ा उस कबाड़ बटोरने वाली औरत की फटे घाघरे में पाबंद के लिए एक बलात्कार के बाद गांव के अमराई में फेंके गए नंगे शव को ढकने के लिए एक बड़े अस्पताल के वर्ष वार्ड में दहेज न लाने वाली नई नवेली के लिए रखे दस नंबर बेड की चादर बनने को और आखिरी टुकड़ा पांच सितारा होटल में पांच ग्राहकों को शराब परोसने वाली लड़की के इतनी सी छोटी बक्श बंधन में सिले जाने के लिए सुबह देखा सुबह देखा सारे टुकड़े लौट आए हैं सारे टुकड़े लौट आए हैं और फिर से जुड़कर मुझे सर से पाओ तक ढकने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं मेरे पेट छाती और पीठ का मेरे पेट छाती और पीठ का तब भी कुछ हिस्सा दिख रहा है इतनी लंबी साड़ी भी जिसे छिपाने को कम पड़ रही है फ्रेंड्स वी आर स्टिल लुकिंग फॉर दैट एलूडिंग लॉन्ग लॉन्ग साड़ी व्हिच इज स्टिल इन एडिक्वेट टू कवर अस ऑल टुगेदर एंड आर कोशिश आवर एफर्ट्स and prayers will go on thank you so much for giving me a present hearing thank you namaste thank you very much parmita ji and now may i request uh, uh, shrimati pratibha nand kumar ji who is a leading kannada poet journalist filmmaker columnist and translator she will also be called uh, filmmaker columnist and translator her publications include 17 collections of poems two of short stories three biographies and one autobiography besides a number of translated books into english and kannada her poems have been translated into several indian and foreign languages she has received several awards including the infosys award for literature bangalore lit fest literature achievement award mahadevi verma kabhe samman dr shiva verma uh, karanta award shiva ram Ka karanta award and uh, hoger memorial award for journalism among others pratibha nand kumar ji first of all uh, thank you sai academy for this uh, opportunity and uh, sorry mamang dai and uh, other friends for gate crashing into their session i was to present the paper in the next session but for some reason i'm here and i will skip all the historical and the names and other things and i will just present five points five major random points that talk about the literature and empowering empowering women <coughs> I am tempted to remark that we never had a seminar with the title "Literature and Men's Empowerment," for the obvious reasons. This topic sounds like a bugle cry of polarization in literature, purely based on gender. It makes us feel like we are trespassing into a field that belongs to men, and we are compelled to defend ourselves for our act of trespassing by reasoning that it empowers women. 
and hence this session. The history of women and literature movement in Kannada in a nutshell I could give, but I'm skipping all that. The first point is, for the first 20 centuries of Indian literature, predominantly written by men for the men, but partly of the women, was primarily for the male gaze. One can easily sum it up as one in one famous definition of women, which from then to now we keep quoting, Karyeshu Dasi, Karaneshu Mantri, Bhojeshu Mata, Shaineshu Rambha, Rupeshu Lakshmi, Chamaya <coughs> Dharitri. And all that that you talk about, the, whether it is the Puranas or the history or whatever, all those women come under this category. They are not apart from this. In Kannada, we have had brilliant example of Saint Akamahadevi of 12th century, who defined every one of these traits and yet got accepted. Read it as real empowered, but with a big bar, only because she was a saint who had renounced the worldly affairs and followed a spiritual path. So women, if you were in a spiritual, if they were in a spiritual path, they could get away with anything. All the Panchamahakanyas and all the Rushimunis that the women you talk of, they could get away with it only because they were on the spiritual path. To this day, when they talk about women's poetry, they start with Akka Mahadevi of 12th century and directly pitch us, the 22nd century mere mortals, against Akka Mahadevi. Just pause it a moment and think what gave her the courage to discard all male as she has a very famous line that says, e no wale She says, take all these mortal men and shove them into the fire. And they accepted it. There's no questions asked. Yet Akka Mahadevi's poetry is always referred to with reverence as poetry of a free mind, of an empowered mind. All the critics also read as readers. World, all the critic world are in awe of Akka Mahadevi's absolutely uninhibited poetry, calling a spade a spade, and also flow freely between the physical and the metaphysical. She called it the Anga Sukha and the Linga Sukha. So she had all the liberty, empowerment, to talk very freely about the Anga Sukha and the Linga Sukha, and everybody accepted it. And jump, 20, jump eight centuries and come to the 20th century, and if you spoke about the Anga Sukha, you know what women would get. So after eight centuries, in between, he had some traditional uh, bhakti poets in the 15th century in the Dasa tradition. Or we have a Halavanaka Tegiriyama in the 19th century. She wrote about the treaty for a good wife. Let me skip all that. The real empowerment arrived with the women authors in the beginning of the previous century because major names like Nanjan Guru Tirumalamba, Saraswati Bai Rajwade, and R. Kalyanam and others were all child widows. They were all widowed in the age of 8, 10, and 12. And they studied, and they got literate, and they studied literature, and used literature to empower themselves. And their stories are fantastic journeys. I'm very tempted, and I did write about it, but I'm going to uh, skip all that and just talk about uh, <coughs> Tirumalamba, who, from Nanjangur, she started a magazine for women. She would collect all the articles, you know, she would tell people, women to write and travel all the way to Dharwad, stay there, get it printed, bring it back to Nanjangur and Mysore and sell them. Her, she being an editor, a publisher, writer and a social activist is a remarkable example of what literature can do to empower women. Then, <laughs> I'm going to cut all that. And let me come to the second phase of women's writing, where in the middle of the last century, there was an attempt to explore the female psyche to the fullest in the mid part of last century, from the 40s to 60s. All kinds of women started writing, and they flooded the market. Triveni to Vani to MK Indra, Anupama Niranjana, and the horde of women, they started writing a lot of literature was created, but the critics called it the kitchen literature. Adige Mane Sahitya. They sneered at it. They never took them seriously. Never was a critical analysis done. 
and they were not given any awards or a membership of any academy or made a chairman of any social or literary event and they sort of uh, put it aside as kitchen literature that led to the third phase of women poets like us we came onto the stage like comets they called us the trailblazers and the comets and then came the progressive movement the dalit movement and the minority movement where the sixth phase of lgbtq literature now has come into the mainstream the digital transformation era has undergone a paradigm shift and the gender perspective is intact in fact the last of the concerns of the lgbtq wave that has hit all arts the demarking line is so blurred now it is a little too late to have a session like this because a love cop poem a love poem can never be taken for granted as between two heterogeneous couple anymore so there is another stream of literature mostly adapted by women all through the centuries which is the folk literature and the folk women they were totally empowered a study of the folk uh, folk poetry or folk stories gives us a glimpse of how liberated and how empowered they were <clears throat> now i'll uh, in fact to bring it to the feministic study of women in literature purely based on folklore will give us an entirely different different conclusions than the classical literature i had uh, noted down lots of examples for that that i'm skipping in today's tiktok time urban folklore is such a mix of ideas that it can be described as a fusion confusion lore where anything is possible and the old norms are thrown to, thrown to the wind and we will come to that later now let me walk you through the content of women's writing and see how it empowered them the first is the language i think the nf has been said about the language i am especially neeraja told about how they are trying to find a language for women i am reminded of a poem by a australian poet who stated that men describe their lover whereas women describe their love that is the major difference between men writing and women writing hence we speak different languages women had a tough time evolving their own language because without giving a name if you give a literature piece of literature to anybody it was not possible to make out whether a man wrote it or a woman wrote it now it is possible because we are finding our language so the minute you see or read a poem you know whether it's a woman writing or a man writing without a name, any name given all class all our classical literature offers itself to rereading from a feminist point of view and the conclusions are entirely the opposite of the primary intent of the text the primary intent was of course typically male oriented of the men by the men for the men the male gaze was the only gaze and the female gaze had to be invented in the past 100 years and it has happened in stages actually the established feminist research says that from time immemorial women have been treated as subservient to men inequality was a very common phenomenon and the oppression was part and parcel of all women's lives note that i use the past tense between 19th and the 21st century indian literature evolved incomparable to any other field or time the literature started talking about women's issues the question of women was being addressed in both radical as well as conservative manner sometimes they revealed contradictory views on the women's question for instance in kannada all women novelists whether radical or conservative were fundamentally conflicted in their own beliefs about the women's proper role and their novels they deal with the complex issues which constitute the women's question to recognize the position of women in society at different times and to know how the women question was has been taken into consideration and how readers receive them if they do not have the proper guidance of entering the test became an issue of utmost importance time and again the literature has portrayed a women of the the women of their period with the binary opposition as an ideal woman and the fallen woman the readers basically do not judge the text that they read but take their favorite writers for granted and consider the provided knowledge as the absolute truth to internalize the portrayal of, portrayal of women or women by the writers from different strata of society read caste 
underwent a remarkable change and today talking about women in literature is basically related to many social issues concerned with the status and the role of women in general. We have come a long way since Anita Nair stating, literature has always been ambivalent in its representation of women. Good women, as in ones who is accepted social norms, were rewarded with happily ever after stories. From fiesty heroines eventually going to find, even fiesty heroines eventually going to find content and life's purpose in a good man's arms. And Susie, Taru and K. Lalita recording in their foreword in the book Women Writing in India 600 BC to early 20th century that, I quote, the women writing emerged as a counter model to male writing for the assertion of their voice in the mainstream literature. Hence, women poets, short story writers and novelists were described as rebels, rebels bold and radical. I end the quote. Today, as I stand here talking about the empowerment of women through literature, I want to declare that we are more labeled, we are no more labeled rebels, bold, radical, as it has become the norm now. Because if you have enough examples, the others can follow. And it is not the, if, if, if there is a woman who is in, unable to express herself, it is not the problem of those who have already established themselves speaking out their mind and the others can should really look at look up to these people as role models and they should follow i expect them to follow if there is one example then they can follow that example there may be pockets exceptions those who are lagging behind but the stage already has been set and much progress has been recorded the third point i want to present is about the autobiographies of women in all languages, we have seen a paradigm shift in the way women's writings were considered. Women autobiographies, a generic term for life narratives, histories, memoirs, testimonials, and hagiographics, has emerged as a genre, consequent to the postmodernist thrust on the identity and the attendant politics surrounding it. Primarily aimed at communicating the subordinated predicament of women, the writings claim the agency. Based on memory, experience, and identity, women narrators reproduce the cultural modes of self-narrating, simultaneously critiquing the status quo. When it comes to the personal lives of women, there is nothing personal about women's personal lives. The personal is political too. Women writing the autobiography is a means of finding the agency. It is therefore worth exploring as to what compels women to write their autobiographies. These are all some quotes I have taken from several uh, seminar papers. Interestingly, a book titled Ahead of Their Times, Essays on Women Autobiography in India, edited by K. Purushottam says, many women who have said earlier found a rebel, bold and radical are now considered as ahead of their times. In Canada, this genre has come into the forefront since last one decade with women writing, revealing their life by barring nothing the humiliation, the many affairs, the decisions, etc. Add to this list the Dalit and transgender writers. It's almost 50 years for women to write their biographies in Canada. Oh my God, I had so much to say and it's already time. So let me just mention two points and close here. The fourth point I wanted to say, the women writers have already established themselves challenging the hegemony in all the forms, including class, Class, gender, relocating their own identity in respective categories. They have debunked the set patterns of female writers. What is unique about the reputation is that instead of reading women's writings as the usually known creative or imaginative, they are now exploring the works in opposition to the masculinized, rational and objective form, which in fact undermines the experiential, <coughs> experimental category. They set up impersonal protocols of the public and political disputes. The women writers have broken into the formal structures and thus are fast changing the rules of the game. Now I'll come to the last uh, part of this. Literature has empowered us, but one cannot talk about women empowerment in literature without reflecting on the treatment of women in society at large. While the globe is discussing gender budgeting, we are still fighting for basic human rights here. 
Atrocities against women have become a daily affair and the arts reflecting them are not influencing the society to the extent needed. Then what empowerment are we talking about? What about the four sequential phases of knowledge building and networking, institutionalizing the process, capacity building, enhancing accountability? Don't they apply to the arts as well, literature being one? If these were to materialize, imagine the number of women writers that would increase in India and imagine the forcefulness of their writing and imagine the impact it would have on the society as a whole. That could be the time when we can really shake off the weaker sex tag, at least in literature, and set free the Gen X women, women writers to stand independent of the male gaze and empower them with amazing clarity of the female gaze. That, my friends, is something to look forward to. Today, writing is a political act, and so we, as women empowered writers, are questioning these eight points that I made note of in all the <coughs> articles that I read about it. One, the problem of women's self-expression is what happens when a woman doesn't use her voice to express herself fully. Two, women have trouble sorting out what her own voice is telling them. Three, women often unknowingly invalidate their innermost thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. These are the general uh, sentences I came across. Most women have been exposed to critical voices, so women often struggle to speak on behalf of themselves. Sometimes our voices have been so silenced and not affirmed that assertive communication feels like we are asking too much. Even ask a little, you feel, you feel guilty. The social media phenomenon, why and how women's self-expression is curtailed in the virtual domain. Findings indicate that men responding to women's online self-expression can fall into any three emergent categories. One, self-proclaimed well-wishers, admirers turned abusers, and the toxically masculine. While the first group silences women discreetly and typically by moral policing or invading the women's personal space, the latter two groups two groups do so more blatantly. Next, as, as women, we have not yet come to know, appreciate, and love ourselves. It is impossible to truly access our authentic voice and determine what we are here to share the world with. When focus is on pleasing others in order to gain acceptance and affection, there is a consequential fear of losing admiration, respect, and ultimately love if we do express ourselves. That fear I see even in the next-gen girls today. Many women start off well and after some time go silent. Why? It's, it's as if, if you don't want to hear me, then I will just be quiet syndrome, which even the next-gen girls have not shaken off. I had so much more to talk, but I think uh, I'll stop now. And thank you for this opportunity. I think I've just rattled off some points that I made, and it was not very, it is very disjointed. But I think you get what I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pratifananda Kumarji. Friends, now may I request. Uh, uh, Srimati Bhuma Viravalli, who is a person of multiple facets. She is a senior officer of the Indian Railways, currently working as principal executive director, Human Resources, Railway Board, Ministry of Railways. She has also held senior positions in IIT, Madras, ISRO, and Indian Institute of Classical Tamil. She writes and translates poems, travelogues, and blogs. Her recent book in translation, Firelets, Glimpses of Bharti's Poetry, has been widely acclaimed. During her tenure as director, Indian Institute of Classical Tamil, she enabled publication of translations of several works of Sangama Tamil literature, including that of Tirukural, Srimati Bhuma Viravalli. Agini Kunjondru Kandain, Ade Angoru Kartinil Pondida Vaitain, When the Taninda the Kadu, Taral Vira till Kunjendru Mupendru Mundo, Tatarida Tatarida the Tom. Good evening, Namaste and Banakam. Leaders of literature here, on the dais and off the dais, 
I presented, I began this session with a small poem from Subramanya Bharati. You cannot talk about uh, women in Tamil literature without talking about Bharati. I'll just uh, read the same in English for you. A tiny spark I found and hid in a hollow deep in the woods. The forest burned down in a trice. In fury power, is there a difference? between a spark and a raging fire tattarigada tattarigada titto madam chairperson of this day you asked a question before the session began whether this is literature for women by women or is it empowerment through literature or in literature i would probably set to empowerment through literature having set that ground I would like to begin my presentation on literature using Tamil uh, literature as a base. Before I begin, the question begs, the, the title begs the question as to what is empowerment and all my reading came to five points. Access to resources, building self-worth, control over their own lives, decision making and choice and enabling social change. All my predecessors who spoke before me have touched on different points. These five together make the empowerment that we are talking about. Fine. Where does literature come into the picture in this? I am looking at literature, as I said, true literature. So empowerment through literature. I am looking at literature as a vehicle for this empowerment. And if I look at empowerment as a journey, and literature is a vehicle for this journey, then it is fueled by three things, expression, empathy, and enablement. So these are the three dimensions which uh, help us traverse this journey, a journey which many people have traveled before, and hopefully many people will be traveling uh, in future. To a point, as my predecessor said, where we don't need to have this seminar, it will be literature for everybody. Starting to think of it, I would like to analyze empowerment through literature from three prisms. There are a lot of people who have contributed to it. I'd like to take an author, a prism of an author, a character, and a book itself. So to begin with, I'd just like to say it from the author's perspective. I'll take an author for a sample. And let's just wind up our time clock over a few decades. Just imagine this environment, a lady, I mean a kid, born in 1901, lost her mother at the age of one, got married at the age of five, and moved on, completely illiterate. The only skill set she possessed was that she could recite Tamil literature like Divya Prabandham, Kambaramayanam, or Devaram, etc., etc., and she could tell stories, and that's it. And this person, after marriage, still illiterate, was taken to a few plays, and then, enchanted by the art of theater, she decided to write a play herself. Believe me, even then she did not know how to read or write. And she wrote her first play, sorry, she dictated her first play, which was written down by her friend. This play, got published, became a big hit, and there was no looking back. Yes, I'm talking about Vaimu Kodai Naegi Amal. I'd like to just say how she empowered herself through literature and she empowered others through literature. From that play, she became a prolific writer to the point that she was the first playwright in Tamil, woman playwright in Tamil, first woman screenplay writer in Tamil movies of that day and she was probably uh, many things beyond that. She learned to read and write after the first play and then started her saga of literature. I'm just looking at a person who uh, could write, could actually bought a magazine and ran the magazine successfully for 35 years. She had faced a lot of problems in the course of her life. Her stories were taken away by the person who published them first and said it was his story. And by sheer memory, she wrote it back and proved that it was hers. 
so she had to go through traverse this journey through several potholes and she did after meeting chance meeting hey she she was a great singer accomplished carnatic musician a lyricist a composer a playwright and so many more things a journalist everything together and her story was a story of not just self empowerment through literature and she used a magazine to pull up extend her hand and pull up many new writers on the way so that is empowerment through the prism of an author for you why mu kodai nayegi ammal i would like to take up a character uh, for an analysis i had a character in mind but then after listening to our chairperson i thought i will switch over to draupadi we all know how powerful draupadi was a character in mahabharata she uh, has seen through a whole gamut of emotions but just imagine a powerful character of draupadi chiseled by a powerful writer like bharati yes panchali sabadam the character of draupadi was so well presented and as it was said by one of my predecessors the best part of draupadi okay the initial stages talks about draupadi as a lover draupadi as an advisor draupadi as a ideal woman all that fine but the real character of draupadi comes out when she asked questions the questions from a charioteer questions to the courtiers questions to the leaders of the kuru clan the question to the emperor the question to her own husband the questions she put to the uh, the torment or dushasan everybody now they are questions all right but in bharati's hand it was not draupadi asking the question it was mother india asking the questions and the violation draupadi faced was not a violation of a woman but the violation of the whole nation that's how he portrayed it and when she asked the question it was a question mother india crying out to her own citizens she was crying out to her leaders to the so called social reformers and to her own kith and kin and even to the british so it was the question the cry outcry of outrage of mother india so he used the character of bharat bharati used the character of draupadi to portray mother india so this is how he woke up not just gentle waking up but literally shook the people of that age the entire tamil speaking world were just told get up and look around you and better get ready to transform that was the power of the character which imbued with bharati's ink made a big huge difference coming then to a book i'm going to take a book which not many are talking about i just want to put a point here you don't have to be a shah jahan and build a taj mahal to leave your mark you don't have to be a raja raja chola and build the big temple to leave a legacy you can just be an ordinary person next door and make your presence felt to the people around you that's what this book is all about i'm talking about yadu magi by uh, ma sushila more known for her translations but this was one of the most soulful renderings of hers she was talking about devi the protagonist of this was again a child widow like we said child widows probably had a lot of creativity wrapped up in them she was a child widow and then uh, she got i think widowed at the age of 8 or 9 and then she got uh, into studying after that wrote her books and uh, became a teacher and continues to influence her family her school her colleagues and then slowly she gets remarried which was a taboo at that time and then starts continuing to be the anchor of the lives of people around you imagine for a moment this is probably a story we all have heard all around the country of that time if there is one sister subalakshmi who sets up a school or a dr muttalakshmi sets up a hospital or a naida skada who sets up a medical college fine it's one person's life but when you put it into a book the words give wings to this life it soars into the sky and 
spread the sauce the seeds of uh, subalakshmi's all over that's the power of literature for you and that's what these women did I, either as an author or as a character or even as a book themselves this is what they did to you this is how it came to life i just want to bring a point to focus i can go on about several authors but ultimately you get the point there we are talking about how do we bring uh, i think it was very beautifully put up by one of them how do we bring this empowerment so we bring it by creating awareness through education building ecosystems that will augment self confidence creating and widening the choices available for women and destroying the structures and institutions that reinforces uh, your inequality and enabling and maximizing access to resources this is what these women did either mythical or literary or real life women did through literature and that is what is bringing the light to us i can go on about so many other people like audeyaka for gently touching the taboo subjects or anutama lakshmi for sensitive portrayal and gently questioning the patriarchy uh, or even shiva shankri for touching vasanti for touching contemporary issues shivakami suhirda yarmi and kuti revati for touching about anguish or the feelings of educated dalits and so on and so forth but you get the point there i just would like to put it pennukku ஞானம் வைத்தான் புவி பேணி வளர்த்திடும் ஈசன் மண்ணுக்குள்ளே சில மூடர் அந்த மாந்தர் நல்லறிவை கெடுத்தார் விமன் வர் இம்பியூட் இன்டியூட்டிவ்லி வித் இன்டெலக்ட் பை த காட் ஹூ கிரியேட்டட் த வேர்ல்ட் அண்ட் இட் இஸ் தோ ஸ்டூபிட் மேன் ஹூ ஹேவ் ஸ்பாயில்ட் திஸ் நேட்டிவ் இன்டெலிஜென்ஸ் திஸ் இஸ் வாட் பாரதி செட் பட்டங்கள் ஆழ்வதும் சட்டங்கள் செய்வதும் பாரினில் பெண்கள் நடத்த வந்தோம் எட்டு மருவினில் ஆணுக்கு இங்கே பெண் இழைப்பில்லை காண் என்று கும்மி அடி பிளே த கும்மி தட் in the search of knowledge women are nowhere below men in their attitude that's with that i end my question i end again tiny spark i found and hid in a hollow deep in the woods the forest burned down in a trice in a fiery part is there a difference between a spark and a raging fire jai hind थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू वेरी मच भूमा जी फ्रेंड्स नाउ वी आर नाउ एट द एंड ऑफ दिस सेशन एंड आई मे इनवाइट ममंग दई जी हु इज अ पोएट एंड नॉवेलिस्ट हेलिंग फ्रॉम अरुणाचल प्रदेश अ फॉर्मर जर्नलिस्ट एंड प्रेसिडेंट अरुणाचल प्रदेश यूनियन ऑफ वर्किंग जर्नलिस्ट्स हर फर्स्ट पब्लिकेशन अरुणाचल प्रदेश द हिडन लैंड bagged the state warrior alvin award she was member arunachal pradesh public service commission in 2011 she was awarded the padma shri and the sahitya academy award in 2017 for her book the black hill in english mamang dai ji I'm sorry the Vaishli we're all running after you because you know people have to leave they have flights to catch but I think we've done everything well on time and I must say I would really like to uh, thank all the distinguished panelists because they came prepared they gave it a lot of thought a lot of attention they presented <laughs> they presented as best they could uh the scenario in their home states and we had such a diversity of you know presentations i think when uh, you are invited for a seminar to be a panelist to come prepared like this is really uh commend commendable i'm forgetting all my words it's a bit late in the evening but i think paying attention giving the subject thought and attention is also quite a big courtesy and i thank everyone for their wonderful presentations i won't go into each because you have heard the very learned discourses but what i had started with you know that lingering doubt about empowerment 
I think all our panelists kind of were thinking about that also. What empowerment, you know, this is putting women's writings into a niche again, and empowerment for whom? I was also thinking on another line that uh, because we write or we are invited here as speakers, writers, authors, when you're traveling, you look at, you know, the little houses on the road, you see people, you think maybe that's a poem, that's a short story. We think about genre, we think about fiction, short story writing, non-fiction, ordinary lives to give voice to the voiceless. But actually, in ordinary life, there is no writing. It's just life. So I was wondering what it means, you know, what are these words that we are talking about now, literature as such, and tagged with women's empowerment. That's why I was asking that, uh, thinking about that, but I think that was also answered very well. We are thinking about examples, about icons, about a place of discourse where you can meet when you have suffered grievously, when you have no recourse and there is nowhere to take your story to, I think the moment you are able to read something, immediately you're connected. So you, you know you are not alone. I think this is the importance of literature for women's empowerment. Others will read and say it has been felt before it has been experienced before, and I can also come forward. Sitting with us, we have uh, Salma Rajati here also, who is a very empowered writer representing her own section of uh, life, let's say. So this discourse is important, and I think that is what we are talking about when we say empowerment, to bring this space and make it available to other women, to other people, for social, political, reformative, whichever way you may look at it. But the main ideal for literature and what we can contribute is language and imagination and also to finding your own story and being able to give expression to it. So without much uh, more, I would just like to end with a little quote here. We are as we are. You know, the, we, we don't want to change identity. We don't want to turn into supermen or superwomen. But we would like to have that freedom of space and expression. And we are talking about the relationship between literature and that empowerment of space and uh, self-expression. So here goes. The moon did not become the sun. It just fell on the desert in great sheets, reams of silver handmade by you. The night is your cottage industry now. The day is your brisk emporium. The world is full of paper. Write to me. Of course, this is from the half-inch Himalayas, Aga Shahid Ali. So I think words, the words of men, the words of women, the words of our ancestors, the words of our great-grandmothers, forefathers, they were the first travelers. And here we are still struggling and still saying there is a long way to go in this journey of the traveling world. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mamang Dai Ji. Bahut bahut dhanyavad aap sab logon ko. Ab ham log agla session shuru karenge. Aap logon se anurodh hai ki aap log sabhagar mein asthan gran karein. Agla sattra hamara Namika Ji ki adhyakshta mein hona hai. Usme hai? Nahi hai? Hai hai. Char. Nahi char rakhni hai. Baaki do hata do. Thank you.
लक्ष्मी अच्छा इधर तो इधर तो है अच्छा ये ममंग भी तो दिया नहीं गया अच्छा कोई बात आप सब लोग कृपया अपना अपना स्थान ग्रहण करें हम लोग अगला सेशन शुरू करेंगे मैं आमंत्रित कर रहा हूं मंच पर अगले सत्र की अध्यक्ष अनामिका जी को अनामिका जी कृपया मंच पर आए और इस सत्र में ये सत्र की वक्ता है साधना शंकर जी निरुपमा दत्त जी और परम्बा श्री योग माया आप सबसे भी अनुरोध होगा कि कृपया मंच पर आए अनामिका जी मंच पर आइए 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 साधना शंकर जी निरुपमा दत्त जी और परम्बा श्री योग माया आप लोग कृपया मंच पर आइए आप लोग अपना अपना स्थान ग्रहण कीजिए हम लोग यह सत्र शुरू करेंगे नहीं उन्होंने कहा कि मुझे साइट पकड़नी है मैं तो उसको ये कर रहा था बाद में आप लोग आप लोग अपने अपना स्थान ग्रहण कीजिए हमारी और एक, एक वक्ता अभी मंच पर नहीं आई है ये श्री योग माया तो है हाँ श्री योग माया निरुपमा दत्त जी ममंग दई जी आप ममंग दई जी प्लीज कम मैं हमारे सचिव डॉक्टर के श्रीनिवास राव से अनुरोध करूंगा कि अनामिका जी का गमछा से अभिनंदन करें तो 
सबसे पहले मैं आमंत्रित कर रहा हूँ परम्बा श्री योग माया को जो संस्कृत में कविताएं कहानियां और निबंध लिखती हैं लेकिन अंग्रेजी ओरिया और हिंदी में भी थोड़ा बहुत काम किया है उन्होंने और संस्कृत में अनुवाद का काम भी करती हैं आप एक वैदिक स्कॉलर हैं और श्री जगन्नाथ संस्कृत विश्वविद्यालय पूरी में वेद विभाग में एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर और विभागाध्यक्ष के रूप में कार्यरत हैं अनेक लेखों और पत्रों के अलावा आपके साथ अकादमिक पुस्तकें और पांच साहित्यिक पुस्तकें प्रकाशित हैं आपको साहित्य अकादमी युवा पुरस्कार और पंडित प्रताप नारायण मिश्र युवा साहित्यकार सम्मान प्राप्त हैं परम्बा श्री योग माया नम सभा सभापति सरस्वती श्रुति महती महीयता ऑल द डिग्नेटरी रेस्पेक्टेड चेयरपर्सन रिनाउंड राइटर एंड पोएट अनामिका मैडम एंड मैडम फ्रॉम इंग्लिश लिटरेचर रेस्पेक्टेड सेक्रेटरी शार एंड ऑल द sahrudaya jar panoishers present here in this session uh, literature and women empowerment it has two aspects one is the empowered women described in literature and another one is the women who were writing with empowerment uh, we will discuss in a bird's eye view about sanskrit literature here and sanskrit literature starts from vedic period and now to this period or the contemporary sanskrit literature first of all the term empowerment means to give her permit power to the powerless but women are already powerful but to change the perspective of the people or the society is the main aim of empowerment or feminism nowadays and this idea is also a westernized idea uh, if we will uh, look into the uh, instances described in our uh, literature we can know about it better sanskrit literature is concerned hinduism and hinduism itself is a monolithic area in i will start from vedic literature vedic society was much fair towards the females as it is said in an auxiliary text that is brahat devata that is after the vedangas there are also a vast literatures there which are related to vedas 29 female seers i will not use the word seer because the befitting word will be rishi rishi darshana parshivu parshivs the वार्ड्स और वर्शिप्स द मंत्र घोषा गोधा विश्व बारा अपाला उपनिषत निषत ब्रह्म जाया जुहूर नाम अगस्त्य सुसादिति इंद्राणी चेन्द्र माता च सरमा रोम शार्वशी लोप मुद्रा च नद्यस्य यमी नारी च शश्वती श्री ही लक्ष्या सार्पराज्ञी वाक श्रद्धा मेधा च दक्षिणा रात्रि सूर्या च सावित्री ब्रह्म बाधिन्य ईरिता दीज आर द ट्वेंटी नाइन कैरेक्टर्स और ट्वेंटी नाइन फीमेल ऋषिज एंड द कैरेक्टर्स ऑफ रोमशा लोपा मुद्रा अदिति विश्ववारा स्वस्वती अपाला यमी वैभस्वती घोषा काक्षीवती अगस्त्य स्वसा स्वसा मीन्स द सिस्टर अगस्ती द सिस्टर ऑफ अगस्ती ऋषि सूर्या सावित्री इंद्राणी जुहु उर्वशी बागम भ्रुणी ऑल दीज आर द एग्जाम्पल्स आई विल जस्ट टच टू थ्री कैरेक्टर्स एंड प्रोसीड आहे विश्ववारा द डटर ऑफ अत्री एंड अनसुया इज डिस्क्राइब्ड बाय द कमेंटेटर शायण सायण इज ए कमेंटेटर ऑफ फोर्टीन सेंचुरी आज सर्वमपी पापरूपम शत्रु बारयत्री एतनामिका प्राची प्रामुखी सती एती एवं भूतम अग्नि प्रति गति विश्ववारा इज ए कैरेक्टर हू परफॉर्म्स दी सैक्रिफिशियल रिचुअल्स इट हर शेल्फ एंड सी परशिप्स द मंत्र एंड सी 
uh, also performs the sacrifice and now it is uh, um, basically women are not allowed to do the sacrifice etc but it is there in the original vedic texts uh, see recites the mantra uh, see perceives the mantra the fifth mandala 28th hymn or sukta agne shardham mahate saubhagaya tava dyumnani uttamani shu dyumnani nama your home shar gruhani sanjaspatyam shuyamana krunushva shatruyatam avitistha mahangshi the mantra is recited in the pavitrishti ashti or sacrificial ritual is known as pavitrishti and it is in the sakamedha parva of chaturmasya chaturmasya is a sacrifice where there are four uh, performances are there and uh, the third one is known as sakamedha maudas gupta a vedic scholar uh, of calcutta university wrote that a more significant and wonderful aspect as regards a woman's right at that is can be detected in the hymn that refers to the poet herself offering the oblations to the fire with sacrificial ladle and this hymn perhaps offers evidence that the in ancient vedic society a woman just as a man could herself do the homes to the fire or to the agni uh, this is the nice example bishwara is the best example then shashwati angirashi the term angirashi shows that she is uh, her father's name is angirasha it's an uh, another uh, powerful woman who retained back the masculinity of her husband through penance uh, and by her good deeds uh, uh, such power is not the external power it is the internal power that is the spirituality the morality and the divineness of a woman or of a lady like shashwati and apala is also another femina female uh, of eighth mandala of the rug veda she uh, perceives the seven mantras of uh, eighth mandala 29 shukta her name is also found in satyashadha brahmana a lost brahmana text of rug veda she is the daughter of a tree she believed to have had some skin disease for which her husband abandoned her as per her father's advice as uh, she did penance and offered soma juice to indra unknowingly knowingly she, she had not performed but unknowingly and uh, with this indra approved her three boons indra means some almighty or some force the divine force boond her three boons and uh, indra grants all the three boons to eradicate her skin disease indra cleans her or uh, uh, modifies her body three times and it is known as then with this news uh, she became so beautiful and her husband came to ask her hand uh, again but she denied with self esteem and the real value of love and responsibility she detained to uh, give him a also a respectful state and uh, she also retained that self esteem and another one is bagambruni she is the female rishi of 10th mandala of rugveda and uh, 10th mandala 125 shukta and she had attained the highest goal it is dharma artha kama moksha all these things uh, we may believe or not believe but all these four things are associated with each and every human being and uh, she attained the ultimate goal that is the realization of a self or the realization of the brahman and with the realization of brahman she expressed her uh, uh, realization about this jagat or this world and she is brahmavadini and likewise ropa mudra juhu etc are there and her mantra aham rashtri sangamani basu naam jikitusi prathama yagniyanam taam ma deva vyadhu purit purutra bhuri sthatra bhurja veshayantim i myself uh, uh, transformed in each and every aspect of this universe she uh, expresses her brahma feeling like this and yam kamaye tang tam ugram krunomi tang brahmanam tam rushim tam shumedham if i wish anybody i make him the learned i make him the intellectual i make him the rishi etc she describes her power like this this is the vedic mantra and uh, it is recited as in a, in a very um uh, ritualistic way in our devi uh, durga puja as the uh, devi shuktam or all these things but it is there in rugveda it is in the 10th mandala 125 him and next uh, uh, came to the spruti literature if we came 
smruti literature it is said uh, manu is de- always uh, seen most of mo- not always but uh, most of the people describe him in a negative way but if we we never discuss or express or expand the positive side of anything this is the drawback of us yatra naryas tu pujyante ramante tatra devataha it is the line of manusmriti third chapter 56th bharsh and again it is said and yatra naryas tu pujyante means that uh, worship it does not mean sit her or worship her that is the respect the regards and that the glory of a lady upadhyayan dasacharya acharyanam shatam pita sahasram tu pitrun mata gauravena atirichyate means one acharya is more than 10 upadhyaya acharya means the gurukula uh, the head of the gurukula is known was acharya at that time and one father is more than 100 acharyas and one mother is more than are more glorious than 1000 father it is told in manusmriti second chapter 145 verse and from smriti literature to upanishads the glory and uh, respect of women are at peak at that no one was bother about caste creed gender etc or such types of barriers or biasness was at not at there at all and the dissemination no, dissemination of a knowledge was important those who are qualified in that uh, in in their field they are free to disseminate or do their business and uh, one another example is jawala from uh, a lower caste lady jawala and her son is satyakama and she is the uh, she builds uh, the satyakama as a rishi and uh, no barrier was there rishi teaches her he, that her child satyakama and he became satyakama jawala and known as uh, his name or gotra is jawala satyakama madash gotra is associated with uh, his name and uh, uh, it is said that the reference of upanayana sanskar for the female without upanayana one cannot do the sacrificial ritual but at that time vishwavara has done it and it is said that pura kalpi tu nari naam mounji bandhana vishyate mounji bandhana naam uh, it means the uh, mounji gra- a, 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 a rope with a munja grass and that is uh, wrapped before the waist and that is the symbol of brahmacharitva and uh, it was there pura kalpe tu nari naam mounji bandhana vishyate it is in jama smriti and uh, female disciples are of two types that is known as sadyadvaha and brahmavadini vividha uh, striyah brahmavadinyah sadyadvahascha tatra brahmavadina brahmavadini naam agnivandhanam vedadhyanam sa gruhe cha bhakya charyam iti all these things are uh, the uh, agni uh, establishing the fire and doing the sacrifice uh, begging the elms as the uh, uh, as uh, krishna shudama we are seeing all these things are females are doing but at their home it is described in in vibhira mitrodaya it is a smriti text and ritual and a uh, griha text means ritualistic text vibhira mitrodaya sanskara prakash and uh, in uh, the satapatha brahmana in that towards the last part of a satapatha brahmana that is related to shukla yajurveda it a, a great genealogy of the rishis is described hundred names are there and those hundred names are uh, uh, associated with their mother's name and uh, their mother's name like katyayani putra pautimashi putra the genealogy is described like this and why the mother's name is associated with the rishi's name and in the commentary uh, by adi shankaracharya shankar's commentary says that uh, a child accolades merits by the noble qualities of his or her mother therefore the name of the mother are associated with the name of the rishis and how great a thought and uh, uh, how uh, the high the respect we can imagine from this and uh, after that the the house of mandana mishra as the name of acharya shankara came here i will go to mandana mishra and ubhay bharati and their house was identified by looking towards the parrots kept outside in cages discuss uh, discussing issues and ontology and epistemological realities associated the, with the vedas in the debate of mandana mishra uh, he is the representative of mimamsa philosophy 
and uh, acharya shankara the uh, uh, who was going to establish vedanta ubhaya bharati the wife of vandana mishra be, uh, played the role of uh, the judge and uh, because uh, she had the knowledge of both mimamsha and vedanta and uh, both of them had no doubt about her impartiality and uh, at that time there is no prohibition to women related to the vedic studies or anything else then why now and uh, this this is the examples of our scriptures and uh, if we say mahabharata it is a line just only one line ardha the half of a person is the female ardha bharya manushyasya bharya sreshtatama sakha bharya moolam trivargasya bharya moolam tari tarishyatah it is in mahabharata adi parva 74 chapter and 40 number bharsh and if we say classical literature only one instance and i will come to the contemporary sanskrit literature bana describes in harsha charitam yasomati the wife of prabhakar vardhan as vishrambhasya vishrambha means the rest or vishram vishrambhasya dharmasya dharma means duty basically it's the uh, basic quality or duty sukhasya cha bhumihi bhumihi she is the best for all these things and in contemporary sanskrit literature uh, if we say first poetry prose poetry poetry and uh, dramas are also there tavalaksha are also there and the child literature is also there translations are also there all these uh, writers are active in all these categories and the power or shakti of sita is beautifully described by abhiraj rajendra mishra in the poem ko va charcha um Am, amritum ravano devehi iesha aso mahashamare prakatita no katham prushtaha vidhatra tena sitecha ravana dies due to the wish of sita this is uh, 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 depicted by the badan poet and uh, let's see the picture of an empowered woman erasing her weaker picture in the poem poem through the poem jhansi rani jhansi ragni lakshmi bai by dr krishna lal uh, swadesh esha me priya swatantrata priya mama bhavatuyam vishrankhala sho matu bhu subachala idam vichintya idam vichintayanti ashau avashun aji ganan nahi mahisi asau na chandika asi dha, asi dhar dhari yadharini this is depicted asidhara dharya dharini this is the epithet given to uh, rani lakshmi bai by the madan poet and uh, in another poem sakte hai abhigya to recognize the power uh, the title of the poem is uh, sakte hai abhigya by archana joshi uh, it is uh, written in the 3 meter maha shakti rashi kila you are the immense power you have the immense powers tomeva sangraksha dharitrim
right? And the simple act of writing, I think all of us, whoever writes in this room, will agree. It gives us expression, it provides an outlet, it can provide a platform for ex activism and any kind of exploration. And for all women who write, all these are important milestones in the creative process. process. But when you look at it, it can only be a milestone if you can actually write in your own name. I just did a little bit of research and I think all of us know that a lot of women, when women started writing, wrote under male pseudonyms and uh, anonymously. I think the most famous that everybody knows of are the Bronte sisters. Even Jane Eyre was first published under a man's name. And To Kill a Mockingbird, that iconic book, was written by a woman who changed her first name to Harper Lee, so that it sounds androgynous and not by a woman. But this is not the story of just the past, you know. It's also pretty current. Because J.K. Rowling did not use her name Joanne Rowling for the Harry Potter books because her publisher advised her that if you use a woman's name, you'll lose out on the young male audience. So actually, you know, women writers also have a long way to go to really realize their aspirations and dreams. Coming to science fiction, uh, Mary Shelley, when she wrote Frankenstein in 1881, she published it anonymously and it was only published in her name in 1821 when it was published in Paris. Frankenstein is supposed to be an often called the first science fiction story or, you know, the origin of science fiction stories. Uh, once again, I lost my page. Now, what is science fiction coming to that? It's traditionally been a male domain. It's always been for men and about men and about wars, aliens, etc., etc. But I must say that in the recent past, a lot of women have started writing very relevant and often feminist science fiction. And what is science fiction? Like any other literature, it is a philosophical delving into the issues and questions in contemporary society. You just imagine something in the future, but you're actually, as an author of science fiction, you are dealing with issues that you face or you have seen in your uh, contemporary lives. But what is interesting about science fiction? Science fiction provides you with a blank and infinite canvas. As a writer of science fiction, uh, uh, if you're talking about women, you can imagine any future in any time, in any space. And you know, these futures in science fiction you'll see are really two. Either they give you hope, or they are dystopias. So science fiction, the spectrum of writing, that infinite uh, canvas uh, kind of uh, floats between hope and dystopias. When we look at science fiction written by women, I'd like to quote uh, Jenny Walmer, who's a feminist writer and a professor who's passed away in 2022. And she said very interestingly that science fiction written by women is, and I quote, at the cutting edge of culture. Through science fiction, for years, women have been exploring the frontiers of science and imagining either being free of their biological bondage of their bodies, or when they write a dystopia, they tend to reinforce the bondage of the biology that actually defines you as a woman. So they explore the female body in the future, sometimes liberated, as I said, or sometimes in dystopias in its biological bondage. And a, a great example of a liberating science fiction, and I picked up, I think, one of the earliest science fiction stories written in our subcontinent. In, it was written by Begum Rokaya in 1905 and published. It's a short story called The Sultana's Dream. It was published in 1905, mind you, okay? And what has uh, Begum Rokaya imagined in this? The gender roles, she's imagined an imaginary lady land, and she's where the gender roles are reversed. And the men are inside the Mardana, and the women are running the world. However, Ladyland, like in many other science fiction books where women are the predominant, uh, I'll use the word species, uh, then they tend to be isolated on an island. Like if you look at the uh, origin of Wonder Woman, she starts on an island, you know. But uh, Ladyland is rooted in, its, in the present, in its, in its own contemporary times. And the queen of Ladyland fights wars with other kingdoms, she trades, and she encourages scientific discoveries. 
on the dystopian side i think all of you would be aware margaret atwood's uh, the handmaiden's tale i think would be uh, a good example of a story that is set in the future where the central character and narrator is one of the handmaidens who who are women who are forcibly assigned to produce children that's their only role in that society and the novel explores the themes of you know loss of female agency how the reproductive rights are taken away and how slowly the women in that future world uh, fight back and try and uh, attain their individuality so science fiction allows women writers not only just to reimagine their bodies and biological bondage in different ways but it also allows you to imagine social constructs very different social const constructs and they might most often than not those social con constructs in science fiction are away and different from the misogyny and patriarchy that we see around you so that is one of the uh, running themes in science fiction you know written by women here i just like to allude to my own experience when i uh, started writing my novel ascendance in 2000 way back it came out ultimately in 2018 i wanted to explore the idea of the relationship how would the relationship between men and women be if once technology takes away our mutual dependence for reproduction what would be the relationship between men and women so actually my science fiction also deals with uh, biology at the basic core but i must add that when i started uh, you know working on my story the idea of immortality and the uh, you know cultural um, value to immortality and how life would be and what would be the social structure if we actually became had long and endless life became a part of companion of the story as i wrote it along but it also began and was rooted in biology and my latest book which is still at a manuscript stage stage i call it continuum it deals again with how things have changed for women and yet yet not changed for women across a uh, uh, spectrum of time and space so as a genre science fiction gives its writers and its audiences the ability to imagine unshackled and different lives and when you imagine something and you will put it out there which maybe resonates or appeals to some uh, to some reader or some audience there is a slight nudge to work towards it you know i tried to see and research a little bit if there's any kind of you know um, research on especially science fiction and how it has impacted uh,
equi equipoise is the key word. And no one knows it better than women that striking the balance, sthit pragyata, samyak drishti is, is the answer to all the crisscross cross currents of echoes. Now, in the first paper that we listened to with patients, she was talking about hyper, I mean, hyper feminine women who have ruled our imagination. Uh, token women like Indian Devis and token women like Brahmavetas. And of course, even Puranic women who have played an ideal wife, sister, whatever. Now, I'm not against, or we are, most of us are not against playing up to an ideal. The only problem is that all the great attributes that they, they stand for, you know, like attributes like Lajja, Dhriti, Sahishnuta, all the major spiritual values of life, I mean, women should not have a monopoly over them. The way men should not monopolize all the economic and social resources, women should also not monopolize all the spiritual. I mean, women, they should all share. We live in a world of care ethics, and sharing is the key word. So poor men, you also must derive from the sadguna kosha or the you know rich resources of sadguna that you uh, identify only women with and women you also should have an equal access to all the material things in life resources and opportunities now now our men have started realizing this and most of the eminent writers in this uh, and i can see many are sitting here who have taken time out and you know they are paying a heed to whatever we are saying against all the cross currents of echoes i mean i'm really thankful to all the men who have the patience to listen to this Tanta Sammit Upadesha that we are all trying to share. It's a very, very, the Lalit is the real word. Lalit is the key word. We are not going to, we are, there is a very, I'm, I'm quoting, I'm doing very something very unconventional. I am quoting a Bhojpuri, Bhojpuri folk song, one line. Chalani se chalal dulha you know, it's been the, the age-long practice of women in the villages, women in the suburban towns, women who have lived a, an underperformed life to carve out babuas and to sieve and, you know, to filter all the, you know, unwanted elements from the grain you eat, all the chaff away. Now, they are all the women writers, whether in Sanskrit or in science fiction, this is what they are doing. They are actually applying a sieve to you. They are trying to make you more lovable. They, are, they want you to be their kind. Now that they are empowered, education have, is, have empowered them. Meera ke prem bel ki tarah, ab to bel phail gai, sri drishti ki. So they are trying to say that, you know, instead of being at the spiritual loneliness, the height of loneliness that most of the women sitting here, I can see so many women, even if they are empowered, they're so lonely because they've not yet met, met many people who are lovable. And they start, that's why they decide to start, stay single, most of them, within marriage or without marriage, they are single. 
isn't it alka they decide to stay single at the, and like dhruva swamini who is still looking for his for her uh, chandragupta they are trying to make a chandragupta of all the ramaguptas who have hyper masculine traits traits now when coming to you know science fiction uh, she referred to sultana's dream and there also you meet a very interesting statement she says that if when men are kept inside and they are not allowed to venture out on the roads most of the crimes in the world will vanish because if the body is the prime center of all kinds of the crimes in the world you know name anything you know take anything you know uh, like about loveless mechanical sex abortion uh beating then abusing then pornography then child trafficking say anything anything and it and you know no prime seat appears to be a woman's body now even in science fiction handmade i mean at wood be it at wood or be, be it avarsha sadhana shankar or the other women writers what are they trying to do they are they are actually trying to create you know when they a, a utopia and they are, are trying to create a lovable man in a love in an ethos which is which is very very comfortable they are not only trying to reframe or recreate the men they are not only trying to give birth to lovable men but they are also through their care ethics trying to create a livable universe the feminist movement is the only woman, movement in the world which has which has risen above the perimeters of ego that's why i began by saying that empowerment at least for women is a mystical process and they realize that they can't empower themselves without empowering others that's why this notion of sisterhood that's why this notion of you know creating male feminists in you people who are more lovable actually and then they are not only you know I'll take the example of liberal feminists they did not have the agenda of women welfare only in their on their minds they they cared for a larger issue and the issue was that of disarmament nuclear disarmament during the time of radical feminism in 60s they talk again they did not only talk, talk talk about the technological fix on women's body that she was sadhana ji was referring to they also took up the major issue of negritude then there were social feminists who cared for the you know who you combined in the, and then we had uh, dalit feminists in our own world and in all these feminists you know created a kind of utopia where the class and the caste questions also merge so race class caste all these things were put under women's lens and today also they are fighting not only for their own welfare in their writings or in their speeches or in in whatever dialogues they are extending to the universe they are also fight you know fighting for the ecological balance so balance is the key word now to curb excesses is of primary importance the way to educate a woman is to educate the whole family you know edu- you know when you liberate a woman you are actually granting wings for the liberation of the whole universe because aurat ke aachal mein sabki mukti ka swapna hai she is not made that way there is an element in her that can efface her ego and that can subsume everybody's ego like you know the construct of the devis or the construct of the theories or the construct of all kinds of constructs in the world 
I mean, they're true to some extent. They play to the idea of, you know, walking in a community, creating a community. Akla Jolore is one part of the story. And Samashti Chitna, or walking, working in collectives, and, you know, rising above the uh, perimeters and the boundaries of caste class and other racial, racial discriminations is another boundary. So for creating an ideal universe, you have to evoke the energy centers in you. You have that power center in all of us. We are all potential. Uh, to, you have the potential to create that lovable woman and the lovable man in, in your fold, a lovable man, a lovable woman, and a livable universe, a sustainable universe without creating cases of excesses. So this is what all literature does. Literature ignite, literature is what? It's like a lightning, it's a flash of lightning in the, in the dark, in a, in a sky replete with clouds. And then there is a flash. What is the flash? What is the purpose of the thunder stroke? What's the purpose of the lightning? Not to create light, but to underline the darkness around you. So it literature only does that, be it through science fiction, be it through rewriting of scriptures, through all kinds of intertextual dialogues. This is what literature, it, may, it opens up your insight and it looks you, it makes you look deep within the heart of things and discover, discover tears in the heart of things. That kind of a karuna, that kind of an, uh, you know, equipoise, that kind of a cooperation. Now, not the, you know, in women's is utopia, Competition is not the key word. Cooperation is the key word. Look how violent we've all become, how violent we've not become not only on frontiers, but also within the confines of the most lovable, I mean, you know, most tender of spots called home. So what is important is to curtail this street of violence and domin, you know, the trade to boss over others. So, you know, women do not believe in the notion of cutthroat competition because it's too violent. It reduces us all to mere rats. If we, even if we win the rat race, we remain a rat. So, the, the potential, actually, women's writing and all the men who create good characters in there, uh, in like people like Radha Vallabhji and people like uh, Omji and many others are the, their fellow feminists who have created such characters, such female characters in their, uh, in their literature who, who believe in the notion of cooperation, of hand-holding. I'm very happy that we are, past, we are past the age of, you know, that kind of violence all around and there are at least some spots here and there where we can rest our hope. So all the best. You just bear this in mind that care ethics and cooperation. They are the key words of women's writers and feminist consciousness. We, we actually want a universe which is free of violence and dominance. And we realize that this, this uh, empowerment is a mystical process. And we can empower ourselves only by empowering others. There is not, no one are not called the other in a woman's world. And when we quote Kabir, we can realize that is the, when he, Kabir says, Jal mein kumbh, kumbh mein jal hai, bahar bhitar pani, phuta kumbh, jal jal hai samana, ya tat katha giyani. Now it's the picture of the ego that has to shatter and then the water in the uh, waters in the individual self be it a woman or be it a woman that's incidental and the waters in the larger community they become one the macrocosmic and the mic macrocosmic 
uh, cosmic, the hierarchy between the two, the hierarchy between the cosmic and the commonplace, the personal and the political, should be shattered like the hierarchy between the rich and the poor, the sovereign and the um, award, the black and the white, all kinds of hierarchies. And it's important that when we lose this room, we, we leave with us maha uthubahu sankalpa, we, because what are devatas? Devatas are all sankalpas. They are all metaphors for the tender feelings that we have in us. So let's, let's you know, leave this hall with the singular promise that we, from today onwards, we'll make cooperation the key words of love of life. Not everybody is special in some way or the other. And it's, it's the primary function of literature to ignite the flame of consciousness in you, Chitta Vistar. Chitta Vistar is the only thing, and this is what women's literature and even fellow men's literature, this is what it's all aiming for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anamika ji. Uh, friends, now may I request uh, uh, Dr. K. Srinivas Rao, our secretary, to propose a vote of thanks. This is the last day of Sahit also, and also the... Oh, our vice president is here, and uh, he, is the, he is the first uh, women vice president of Sahit Academy, and this will be a very... Uh, Very pleasant moment if he if she come and uh, uh, say a few words and also propose a vote of thanks. माफी चाहूँगी एक साथ कई पार्लर सेशन चल रहे होते हैं तो बिल्कुल अंत में पहुँच पाई हूँ और पूरा मैं सुन नहीं पाई हूँ और निश्चित तौर पर साहित्य और महिला सशक्तिकरण पर है तो बहुत ही अच्छा ये सत्र रहा होगा क्योंकि सभी जो है यहाँ प्रतिष्ठित रचनाकार बैठी हुई हैं मेरी भूमिका यहाँ पर धन्यवाद देने की हो गई है उपाध्यक्ष ऐसे ही आता है तो भाई धन्यवाद दे दीजिए तो मैंने पहले भी सुनती रही हूँ और स्त्री लेखन की दृष्टि से अगर देखा जाए तो इस समय बहुत ही सुखद माहौल है एक ज़माना था नई कहानी का जब दौर था और नई कहानी के दौर में जब स्त्री लेखन की बात होती थी तो तीन महिलाओं के नाम जो है वो अंत में लिए जाते थे कि कृष्णा सोप्ति उषा प्रियमवदा और मनु भंडारी ये तीन लेखिकाएं भी लिख रही हैं लेकिन आज का जो माहौल है उसमें मैं कहना चाहूंगी कि पाठक भी और प्रकाशक भी आलोचक भी महिला लेखन को नजरअंदाज नहीं कर सकते उन्होंने बहुत ही सशक्त उपस्थिति जो है लेखन में अपनी दर्ज कराई है हालांकि बहुत सारे लोग मुझसे सवाल करते हैं कि स्त्री लेखन तो मैं इस लेखन को स्त्री लेखन और पुरुष लेखन में नहीं बांट करके देखती हूँ लेखन लेखन होता है चाहे वो पुरुष की कलम से आए चाहे वो स्त्री की कलम से आए और जनाना डब्बा और मर्दाना डब्बा इसमें लेखन को बांटना नहीं चाहिए और लेकिन ये कहना चाहूँगी कि नारी चेतना ये इस समय साहित्य में बहुत महत्वपूर्ण बिंदु की तरह से उभरा है और उसको पुरुष लेखन में भी देखा जाना चाहिए कि वहाँ नारी चेतना कैसे आती है जब हमारे पास साहित्य को विमर्श में हमने उस तरह से नहीं बांटा था तब भी अगर आप देखें तो धामी भारती की गुल की बन्नो कमलेश्वर की देवा की माँ ये ऐसी सशक्त रचनाएं इतनी मर्मांतक रचनाएं जो है साहित्य में आई थी तो उन रचनाओं को भी और आगे जो पुरुष लेखन में आ रही हैं चीजें स्त्रियों के लिए और मुझे लगता है कि आ, समय बदल रहा है और परकाया प्रवेश करके ही हालांकि परकाया प्रवेश करके ये है कि प्रामाणिकता नहीं आ पाती है कहते हैं लेकिन एक संवेदना है और एक आ, हम एक नए भारत की तरफ बढ़ रहे हैं और माइक्रो स्तर पर 
अपने भीतर की चेतना से लैस जो महिलाएं हैं उनको मैक्रो स्तर पर इस समय समाज का साथ भी मिल रहा है देश का साथ भी मिल रहा है और ये बहुत ही सुखद तस्वीर है इसी बात के साथ इसी के साथ मैं अपनी बात यहाँ पर समाप्त करती हूँ आप सब यहाँ पर साहित्य अकादमी में आए और इतना अच्छा सत्र था निश्चित तौर पर रहा होगा बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद और जिन्होंने भी यहाँ सुना क्योंकि अगर सुनने वाले लोग नहीं होते हैं तो बोलने वालों के वक्तव्य एग्जिस्टेंस में आ नहीं सकते हैं तो आप सबका भी बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद नमस्कार